mute your mics, but as always with these presentations, if you have a question or a comment while the presentation is going, please feel free to ask it. Uh, a lot of the time when you're presenting, if you just put your hand up, we don't always see the hand. So if you do raise your hand and we don't call on you immediately, just clear your throat or interrupt verbally. Don't, don't hesitate to do that. Uh, if you have a question or a general question, just post it in the chat to myself or Mark or even in the general chat. We'll go through that before we open it up for discussion after. Uh, I would uh, like to take this opportunity to welcome our presenter today, Mr. Jeff Priest. I've known Jeff for quite a while. Uh, he has always been a fantastic caller, a fantastic entertainer, and a person who didn't matter which size of convention, which size of hall you would go in. If there's a thousand dancers at a dance, you'd probably have a good three quarters of them in the hall with Jeff and the rest aren't there because there's no more room left in the hall. Doesn't matter who's calling. He has that much of a draw and he is that good of an entertainer. And he's with us tonight. I mean, I could sing his accolades forever, but please go on to his website, go on to the um, Canadian Callers College. There's a lot of fantastic material. He's got a lot of books and whatnot that are there, especially for new callers, for journeyman callers, and for experienced callers that help you develop your calling skills, your calling programs for the benefit of the dancers. Uh, he comes from Ontario, but we won't hold that against him. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, please welcome Mr. Jeff Priest. Thanks for coming in, Jeff. Thanks, Mel. My pleasure. Glad to be back here again. Um, looking forward to this, uh, our, our topic, and I'm going to hit the share screen here now. Uh, boom. There's our topic, degree of difficulty. And I got to say, it's a topic that many avoid talking about. Why? Well, basically, because it's a personal thing. And it, and it truly is a personal thing. And we'll kind of go through some stuff here. And you'll get a better understanding as to why it's a personal thing. Uh, personally, I could talk about this topic for hours. There are so many components, so many things to look at. But today, what we're basically going to talk about is just the basic components. So you can get an idea of the degree of difficulty that you present to your dancers. What terms should we use to measure difficulty? Easy, medium, hard? How about outrageous? And there are some callers out there who truly get outrageous with their degree of difficulty. Should we call with any component of difficulty at all? I'm going to suggest that in my opinion, every caller introduces an element of difficulty almost every time they call a dance. Does it affect every dancer? Maybe, maybe not. Does it happen on purpose? Maybe, maybe not. Does it cause damage? Maybe, maybe not. Can it be taken back? No. Once it's called, you can't retract it. Can it be repaired or softened? Possibly. Our topic tonight is degree of difficulty. Fun versus frustration. So. Can we have a perfect balance? I believe we can, but it takes work, a lot of work on your part. Let's look at some of the things that can cause difficulties. Things to consider, lack of knowledge. Obviously, if they've never heard the call, they don't know it, they can't do it. That's very difficult. Unfamiliar setup. If they're not used to left-handed or DVD concepts and you call something that fits that category, they can't do it. That's very difficult. Consecutive program calls. Those types of things where you've got a mainstream class and they've just graduated and you've decided that you want to test them out on as many calls as you can in one sequence. And you string all those calls together. That's difficult. For them. Not for you, but for them. Flow. This is one of our biggest issues for creating a degree of difficulty. Speed or tempo, are you calling too fast? That'll be tough for some people. Are you calling too slow? Believe it or not, that will also be tough for some people because if you're calling too slow and they've got time to stop and think, they'll be thinking about getting the car washed, taking it in for service. The ladies will be thinking about doing the laundry, what's on the grocery list. And all of a sudden they're gonna break down and you're not gonna know why. 
That's a degree of difficulty. Tip length. Have you called too long? Are they tired? How long do you average call your tips? I mean, when we first started, when I first started calling anyway, we used records. They were all 45s. And on average, our patter record was about four minutes. The rule was you went once and a half to the record. So you're doing about a six minute patter. I've seen callers now do up to 15, 18 minutes in a patter. But dancers are dying. That increases the degree of difficulty. They've lost their concentration. Call delivery. Lead time. Do you have a nice, even, steady cadence? Are you stacking calls? Are you saying, head, square through four, swing through boys, run, and Ferris wheel, and waiting till they get there, and then saying, centers pass through, touch a quarter, and scoot back? Are you stacking your calls? That's making it difficult for the dancer. They've got to remember them all now. Are you clipping? Are you making them run? Are you saying, head, square through four, and only giving them six beats instead of the 10? Swing through. Are you giving them four beats instead of the six? All those things are going to create a great degree of difficulty. You need to be aware of that. Acoustics. In today's dancer population, we have a lot of dancers who wear hearing aids. If they can't hear what you're saying, they can't dance it. That's tough. That increases the degree of difficulty. For everybody? No, not necessarily. Only those that have got issues with the hearing. Age and ability. That's a biggie for today. Age and ability. Can they move the way you're calling? You know, you can prepare a, a pattern sequence and you can call it for 30 somethings and they'll have no issues whatsoever. You call it for 80 year olds and all of a sudden they're breaking down all over the place. And you're thinking, why? I just called this yesterday for another group and they did it just fine. It's because you've got to know your audience. That increases your degree of difficulty or decreases your degree of difficulty depending on who your dancers are. Interest. Is everybody interested in being there? You've got a square dance tonight. There's a major hockey game on. At least six or seven of the guys that are there dancing wanted to stay home and watch the hockey game. But no, their wives said, you've got to come dancing. Is their mind on the dancing? No. Are they going to break down squares? Most likely. Is it your degree of difficulty? Maybe, maybe not. Doesn't affect everybody. But it's all things that you have to consider when you're looking at your degree of difficulty. Atmosphere. What is the atmosphere of your dance? Is it a party night? Is everybody just there to have a good time? They don't want to think? Uh, has, has the club president just got up and announced the death of a long-term member? So are people's minds now thinking about that person? You know, there's different things that you've got to look at. Did they just drive there in a big snowstorm and now they're all tense? They, you want to relax them. Your degree of difficulty is going to either help or not help that particular situation. Gimmicks. Yeah, gimmicks can really be an issue. Gimmicks are great, and most callers use gimmicks. But small, a little gimmick goes a long, long way. It's not something you want to do every night. Towards, towards the end of this, I'm going to show you a few gimmicks that I know have been used, and I've used a couple myself, and they're kind of fun. But as I say, they go a long way. They increase your degree of difficulty. But in my opinion, one of the biggest difficulties that the dancers experience is caller creativity, your ego. We all have one. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this business. Now what we have to do is temper that so that we can actually keep everybody dancing, happy, and fun, not frustrated. <clears throat> What I want to talk about tonight is how to soften the blow and reduce the frustration level when you want to introduce something that might be difficult. I mean, let's face it, we all call things that might be difficult. What we want to do is have the dancer be successful at it. However, before we can discuss how to soften the blow, you need to know what is difficult and why. So for the next part, you need to participate. I'm going to show you some figures and I want you to tell me why they might or might not be difficult. You see, to truly control your degree of difficulty, you need to know your audience. And with any audience, you need to recognize that there are at least three skill levels of dancers on your floor. Those that have attended regularly, those that have attended when they could, and those that dance with other callers in other programs. 
based on my experience, my opinion is you need to temper your degree of difficulty to the first group, those that have attended regularly. These are the supporters. These are the mainstay of your group. You can't base your calling on the hot shots or those that only come when it suits them. They're gonna break down anyway. Okay, so the next few slides I'm gonna show you have some sequences that I have seen called by callers in a live environment. They either didn't realize the impact or really just wanted to see if the dancers could dance what they called. These sequences don't go beyond mainstream, so hopefully everyone will be able to participate in this. Understand everything in these sequences is completely legal. It's all doable. Just have a look, we're gonna go through them. And if you wanna fire out some thoughts as to what you think might be a challenge or might create some difficulties, let's hear them. First one, here we are calling for dancers that have just graduated from the basic program. It's their graduation night, they're having a party. Caller gets up and here's the sequence he calls. Heads lead right, veer right, couple circulate, bend the line, reverse flutter wheel, pass the ocean, ladies trade, boys run, bend the line, pass through, bend the line, circle left. Picture those things in your mind as a caller and see if you can point out anything that might cause an issue with the dancers. First thing, they want to veer left. Okay. So you, you think the veer right is an issue? It, it, it would give them a little pause. Okay. Any other comments? I guess the caller is a friend from a doctor because he's going to have surgery the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I look at that reverse, that reverse flutter wheel. Uh -huh. yeah. what are you thinking well you're, forward, forward. you're bending in so the outside dancer is coming with a forward action the center dancer is either pivoting or backing up and then has to have a complete direction change on a reverse flutter wheel right okay so the lead right and the veer right doesn't flow at all obviously that was the first thing that was pointed out and it's very obvious that they do not flow no question about it Bend the line from a counterclockwise line and a reverse flutter wheel also presents total body reversal like Mel pointed out. Flutter wheel would have been the better call. You got a little further down, having the boys run when on the ends is fine, but the next call should have been a forward action like a circulate or a trade, not a bend the line because he's running and now he's backing up to bend that line. Or cast off three quarter if you have to achieve that line. Okay, there's, there's other ways to get there. But that Absolutely. was basic, wasn't it? Didn't you say Sorry. it was a basic? This is a basic class. Yeah, you can't cast off three quarters in that particular situation. But you could trade and you could hinge. Okay, next one, same group. Head star through, centers pass through, veer right, wheel and deal, pass through, trade by, veer left. Ferris wheel, zoom, centers pass through. Comments? They're all quiet. Veer and right after center after centers passing through. Yep. I've heard that. Mm -hmm. I've never had a problem with it, but I've heard some older dancers complain about it. Yep. Veer right from a forward motion in most cases will cause issues. They're, they're moving forward. Now they got to stop dead and slide sideways. That often can present problems. That's a degree of difficulty. If you're calling this for a teen group, man, they'd waltz through that and wouldn't even hesitate. You're calling that for 70 or 80 year olds, you bet your life they're going to complain about it. Wheel and deal from a counterclockwise line is usually a surprise to some. Not necessarily always, as we said, does it affect all the dancers? No, but you've got to be aware that it's going to affect some dancers when you're calling stuff like this. And it's the uphill Again, Ferris wheel and the uphill wheel and deal. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And the veer left again from a forward motion is a tough action for a lot of dancers. All right, so now we've got uh, the next sequence is a mainstream group and they're celebrating their club anniversary. We've got heads left square through, swing through, boys trade, 
boys cross run, girls run, wheel and deal, sweep a quarter twice, veer left, bend the line, flutter wheel, pass through and alaman left. Remember, I've watched floors do this. I've seen callers call these things. I'm very dizzy. What do you see there? Hand availability from the left square through to the swing through. Very good. Uh -huh. Hand availability is terrible for that. It's, it's down at their side. They've just let go of the right hand on the pull by from the left swing through, or left square through rather. Anything the, else you the see? Gir the girls run. Yeah, okay. A lot of overflow for the boys. They swing through. And boys then the trade, boys, boys cross, cross, boys run, cross yeah. run. We land in sweep a quarter, just continue the overflow. Yeah. Okay. You see anything after the sweep a quarter twice and veer left? Flatter. That should be a veer right. That would work better for sure. All right, so first off, it's a party night. They're having a ball. Lots of thinking really doesn't fit this program. This would be okay if you're doing a workshop night, but there's a couple of things that are actually wrong with it. Or in my opinion, they create a higher degree of difficulty than they would have to. Swing through in this situation and it was pointed out. The centers have got their hand behind their back for the swing through. It makes it very tough to get it up there in a hurry to stay in time with the call. Ladies are running left. Did you guys see that? How often do you have your ladies run left? That's tough. That is difficult for a lot of women to run left. First off, most callers don't have the women run at all. It's usually the boy that runs. But, and then when you have them run and you have them run left, that's a tough piece. Wheel and deal is counterclockwise. Again, it's difficult for some people. That's a challenge. They're not used to seeing it. The veer left is total reversal of body flow. The flutter wheel after this bend the line is also very poor flow because it should be a reverse flutter wheel or at the very least use a forward and back to get them to straighten out so they come back and the right person can go in. Same group, heads right and left through, heads lead right, veer right, partner trade, bend the line, star through, veer left, ladies run, boys cross run, recycle, veer right, Bend the line, square through two, Alaman left. See any issues there that are going to increase our degree of difficulty? Your first veer right is bad flow. Agreed. Oh, the lead right, right, right. Right. Recycle is out of the list. Recycle is out of the list as well. No, it's no, the mainstream. mainstream. It's I thought mainstream. you said it was a beginner group party. No, wasn't no. It? We're, in there, we're at our mainstream group now. Oh, I beg, beg your pardon. Yeah, recycle works. If yeah, but recycle and veer right doesn't. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> the right neither, and the right neither and does, neither it's does loaded the right with and, bad flow. The right and left through and the lead right is horrible flow. He's courtesy turning her. It should be natural to lead left. Right? It's still a party yeah. night, though. And we're still working here on, on some challenging stuff. After right and left through, the body flow is to the left. The lead right and veer right, that's horrible. That mm -hmm. increases your degree of difficulty, in my opinion, 100%. That partner trade and bend the line is like having run in and bend out. There you go. Partner trade and bend the line, again, is total body reversal for the new center. It's, it, this stuff doesn't flow at all. But as I say, I've seen callers do this to their dancers. They want it. They want to use the call, but they haven't figured out yet how to set it up. And that's one of the biggest things that we've got to do in order to be able to have the dancers be successful is to set them up so they can be successful. All right, star through and veer left. The dancers do it, but the flow is horrible for the ladies. I've seen callers do this and it drives me nuts because when they start through, she's coming through to her right, and now he's gonna jerk her back to her left because he's gonna veer left. And for the guy callers out there that are saying, well, that's not difficult, you call and you dance a star through and veer right, and you'll find out exactly what she goes through. It's a horrible sequence, but callers use it all the time. And Recycle yeah. it, yeah. 
just just to comment on that the the star through and veer right a lot of people will do that but you also have to take into account that the lady's doing a very tight turn on the inside as the man is walking around so he's got more fluid motion than that lady has she's doing a forward and a left pivot on the spot which is what well, that's really what makes that awkward yeah is that tightness of that turn well, I think from a lady's perspective, what they have done to adapt for that is instead of just doing a quarter turn when they do that star through, they actually do more of a three, uh, a, a larger turn so that they're actually facing to go left, which so makes it a lot easier to do. So they have adapted yeah. how that call is done. Right. And so they're making up for the caller's inadequacies of flow. <laughs> And, and that's yeah. and that's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, recycle and veer right. All I can say is, wow, <laughs> that's just horrible. Uh, partner trade works much better. <laughs> you don't need the recycle and the veer right. Just do a partner trade. Uh, it sucks if you're going to do a partner trade and bend a line. You got to do something else to offset that. But that's just terrible. Uh, this uh, is Jeff? from Main. Yep. I have a general question because you said something. This increases. Um, uh, the difficulty, degree of difficulty, um, extremely uh, yep. to that one sequence. Um, I wouldn't say if you know something is against the body flow and, and you know not really danceable. I wouldn't say this is a degree uh, increase of difficulty. It just should not be called because to me, increase of difficulty should be danceable but challenging material. Otherwise, um, we would make it you know like ch understand what I mean. Yeah, I understand exactly what you mean. Otherwise, I, we would give I think a that... green light to say, okay, but it's challenging and let's do it. But, you know, it should not be done. And, and that's why I, I said at the very beginning that the, one of the reasons that this topic is not discussed a whole lot is because it's very personal. And yeah. it's true. It's very personal. There are callers. The person that called that didn't see anything wrong with what he was calling. Nothing. He thought it was a great sequence. There was no degree of difficulty for him whatsoever when he called that. Uh, I talked I to think, him afterwards. Yeah. I, so, I think uh, on that comment is a good, this, this was put in the chat and says, yep. um, you're, you're gauging degree of difficulty based on dancer success or how the dancers feel about it is what you're calling difficult. Now you got that it. Was, that was, I was saving that to the end, but it's, it's a valid comment because degree of difficulty is, as you say, it's a personal interpretation as to what's difficult, but correct. He said what, what you're gauging this on is if the dancers succeed comfortably, yep. it's not difficult. If they get through it, but it's not comfortable or they're tired, it's difficult. The degree of difficulty increases the harder they fail or the harder they have to work at it. Yeah. All right. The next That's one weird. we're going to look at is for our mainstream teen, mainstream teen club graduation dance. Heads past the ocean, extend, left swing through. Boys run, bend the line, flutter wheel, pass through, bend the line, star through, pass through, trade by, Alaman left. See anything at all wrong with that one? Any comments? The extend and then a left swing through? Yep. Well, that is challenging, but you know. Yeah. Like for me, I wouldn't, I don't really have a problem with that one, but I would cue that one or you know i'd say who's in the center or girl start or something like that left and really emphasize the left for success mm -hmm. okay but, so the left swing through from a right hand wave is nice it has great flow but it's a surprise for most dancers will a teen club get through this i'll lay you 10 to 1 absolutely they wouldn't even wouldn't even skip a beat 70 year olds nope they'd think about it you'd have to really give them a lot of clues that's why i say you got to know your audience you got to know who's doing the dancing so that your degree of difficulty is either way up here or way down here or non-existent depending on their skill level the boys I'd rather see the, the boys boy run and bend the line yeah, boys to have run. a overflow and then yep. the flubby wheel doesn't work, really work with the bend the line there you go. That's, so the, yeah, that's so the really the run only here one is a bit overflow, but not horrible. However, yeah. the flutter wheel should be a reverse flutter wheel or something to break the flow. A forward and back will often do that for you. All right. Same group. Teen club. Head square through four. Swing through. Boys run. Bend the line. Right and left through. Dixie style to a wave. Boys trade. Boys run. Bend the line. Dixie style to a wave. 
boys fold, girls you turn back, and Alla Man left. Now, I know that some of the folks that are talking here are some of the experienced callers. Do we have any of the newbies that have actually can, can pick any of this stuff out? I'd say that works, you know. Okay. It's challenging, the second, but. The second boy's run is to the left. Sometimes when you're calling something like this, you'd want to give them a clue. You'd want to let them know they're going left. However, the Dixie style to a wave with the boys in the right-hand position would drop most mainstream floors. Will it drop a teen club? Probably not. Your audience here would waltz through that without even hesitating. Yeah. Call that for your regular standard um, mainstream club, and they'd fall apart right there. That increased your degree of difficulty immensely because you have the boy leading. Right. So that's that's a challenge. Again, you better know your audience. All right. This is for a new caller night. You are calling the patter for a student caller who is doing the singing call. Here's the patter you called. Heads forward and back. Star through. Centers do a U turn back. Everybody dose to do. Everybody pass through. Everybody U turn back. Pass through. Centers right and left through. Outsides, you turn back. Centers, pass through. Alamein left. Do we see anything wrong with any of this choreography? Well, from the perspective that it's a new caller night and the new caller is doing the singing call, he will look very good. I don't I think. I, I, I would yeah. actually think the opposite. You're, you're me too. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're preparing... By calling something like that, the dancers that go through it, they like Jeff, if you got up there and called that or Guga or, or Jeff's idol, if you got up there and called that and you got a new caller following, you would think that that new caller is going to be calling something like that. You set them up and you told the dancers that this guy's not very good. He's going to be calling some very, very basic choreography. And if he gets up there and does a really nice singing call, great. But it's something that, I don't know, it, it just makes it, feel to me like you're talking down you're having the dancers talk down to the new caller getting them ready to well yep. you could fail at this so we're going to make it simple so my it's putting my something thoughts, in their head that shouldn't be there my thoughts on this one is so maybe, this is far too involved as a warm-up tip for a new caller far too but but, but same sex but also this could, cause issues guido go ahead uh, but this could also be part of the choreography of a singing call maybe well. so you you want the dancers up that they don't fail when the new caller sings because he does next not comment you should call simple basics that are standard and relaxed best to use the singing call figure for the new caller who is going to ensure their success if you <laughs> use their sequence to warm the dancers up which is really what you should be doing if you're doing a new caller night you want to make sure that those callers are successful even if they're not really really great or really even good you want to make them look good. Your job there, again, know your audience. You want to set the dancers up to win for the next person who's coming up on stage. I admit 100% to what you said, but on the other hand, you know, I don't think that he's going to react to that hoedown or pattern you're doing there. Because if he's doing a singing call, he has it already fixed. He's going to do his singing call, especially as a new caller, as he has trained it and learned it done by heart or, or reading whatever system he uses. So I don't think this would affect his calling. Um, I think it's poor to do something like this before a singing call for a new caller. Um, but I don't think it would trick uh, the new caller. Well, it would trick the new caller either. But I, I disagree. Think it... Who's that? I, I, I disagree. I think that in such a situation, it's important to not get the 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 corners not to get too far away so they could also see and follow whatever whatever i think i'm doing this was a sequence where you didn't find the corner until the very last spot see i i look at if, if and i agree with you like for instance if, if i had a singing call and the figure was head square through split the outside two round one past the ocean i've got the boys in the center swing through recycle 
left touch a quarter, boys fold, girls turn back, star through, couple circulate and promenade home. And I'd practice that and I'd practice that because that's the figure that was written on the singing call and I'm, I'm going to present that. And I'm nervous. Jeff's going to get up there and call that head star through, do a U-turn back, do a do side do pass or everybody U-turn back. And that's his sequence in his pattern call. That's setting me up, but it's not preparing the dancers for the success. I would look at what is the singing call figure that that caller is going to use well beforehand, talk about that and set the dancers up so they could do that left swing through, or they could do that recycle. They could do the pass the ocean with the boys on the uh, uh, boys on the right hand side and, and do that kind of material in the patter to set the dancers up for success. Right. I agree. Yeah, I'm 100% with that, but I've done a whole bunch of dances with new callers when we have the caller school and set it up. Um, and I know that if they're nervous and, you know, some of them only do the singing call, some of them do the pattern. Uh, most of them do the singing call when we have an, an open night where dancers come in and everybody's just curious about his singing call. He's been practicing all week uh, or all call to school day. And they really don't have the ability because they're nervous like hell to see what is going on and what the others are doing. They're so focused on their, their singing call um, that I think it doesn't work. But I admit that a caller, especially an experienced caller, should prepare for whatever uh, is going to be presented and prepare the dance floor so they don't get um, out of the flow and out of a mood um, so they can enjoy the singing call. Yeah. Which is the whole point about what we're talking about. Right. Okay, so next, next on our thing is what about gimmicks or trickery? Now, trickery, that's a, that's a kind of a fancy word for some of the stuff we're going to show you here. But Alaman left to an Alamo ring, everybody circle. Boys right, girls left. Well, they stopped <laughs> dead. They stopped dead. But it only takes them about, you know, maybe three seconds, and they figure out, oh, we're all going to go the same way. Hmm. Boys are looking in, girls are looking out. So you've got your... Boys can go left, girls can go right, boys can go right, girls can go left. They're all still going to circle the same way. That's a gimmick. It's just a gimmick. It's a lot of fun. Use it once. Don't use it repetitively. Don't use it every night. But it is a gimmick, and it's fun. Circle left. Walk all around the great big ring. Well, that's too bad because they're already halfway around their corner by the time they've heard walk all around. And now they've got to all scurry back and get into the circle because you want them to circle left. That's a gimmick. It's also trickery and, you know, that can break a floor and I'm not sure why, you know, people would want to do that on purpose, but it's a gimmick. Square through four heads. They're all going to wait for you again. That's just a gimmick. You're telling them who, but you're waiting. All right. Those things are all used right and left through right after you bend the line. Well, they've already started their right and left through. Now they got to bend the line and go the other way. Those are gimmicks. It's trickery. Okay. I'm not saying don't use them. I'm saying if you do use them, use them very, very sparingly. A little goes a very long way with this kind of stuff. This one drives me nuts. Ladies lead, flutter wheel. And then the next sequence, he says, ladies lead, Dixie style to a wave. Too late. They're already started to flutter wheel. The call is flutter wheel. The call is Dixie style to a wave. Ladies lead has nothing to do with the name of the call. Don't call it like that. Call flutter wheel. Go girls or ladies go. Dixie style to a wave. Ladies go. That's if you want to tell them who's going, tell them. But don't tell them first. Give them the name of the call first. And then they won't get, get them confused. In, in con on, on your Dixie style, um, like ladies lead Dixie style is a very common expression. I know. But I, I usually hear that where I've got ladies lead Dixie style or boys lead Dixie style and they used interchangeably. Right. Uh, and, and that's more of a prompt than part of the call. Uh, when I have the boys on the right hand side, I'll call Dixie style. Go boys. And, and that'll be their clue to go rather than boys lead. Okay. Um, it's just something. It's the way I call. I like to give them the name of the call first. I think that's fair. I think they need to know what's coming. And then if they the, need help, then you can give them the help. The, the ladies lead Dixie style to a wave uh, comes from a time when the standard 
starting formation for Dixie style to an ocean wave was a double pass through formation. And you have the ladies in the lead for a Dixie style to an ocean wave. And that's where it comes from. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I've been calling for 56 years. I didn't realize that. I always um, thought I always thought we always started that with on a double track, Dixie style to a wave. That's the way we started it. No, the the Dixie style to an ocean wave comes from a from, from the called Dixie Grand and the starting formation for Dixie Grand is a double pass through formation. If you have yep. Uh, facing lines, you first have the right hand dancer go in front to make a double pass through formation. And uh, usually you had the ladies in the lead for that. When, when you start from regular, uh, from, from zero arrangement couples, then you have the ladies in the lead for Dixie style to an ocean wave. And uh, if you have a double pass through formation, uh, you also could call ladies lead flutter wheel. And uh, as any of the stuff goes, it uh, deteriorates over the generations. So uh, whatever is common, common sense uh, one, in one generation, uh, two or three generations, nobody doesn't know it anymore. They just use the phrase. It, sound, it sounds like you're both saying pretty much the same thing. It's just one is a prompt from a position has become part of the vernacular that has yeah. confused it as the movement progressed. Yeah. All right. Daryl so has his hand show up. You. And yeah. this is, you might, sorry, Jeff. Daryl's got go his hand up, Jeff. Go ahead. You might consider uh, the uh, timing of the presentation, too. Dixie style to wave and Dixie style, or ladies lead Dixie style to wave, ladies lead to a flutter wheel. Uh, they both begin about the same way. Uh, and if you've got, enough lead time on it it's not a problem uh, if you're calling that close to uh, the dance action i think it might be agreed that was one of the things we pointed out as one of the difficulties what's your lead time how are you how are you delivering your calls again that all increases or decreases your degree of difficulty uh last one here head star through sides face grand square this is a gimmick guys it times out perfectly, given 32 beats. It works wonderfully. But you've got to make darn sure that at that beat number 28, you're ready to say head square through three in the middle. Because when they come in, if you don't say that, they'll fix it for you and get home. Because they should end up facing exactly as they were after they did the star through. That was their starting position. All right. So it's, it's a great gimmick. It works. It's 32 beats. It's perfect. Use it, but don't use it a lot. All right. So I've given you some of my observations of what can cause difficulties. So if you feel that you must use any of these things that we've pointed out so far, let's see how we can soften the blow. Softening the blow is going to decrease the frustration. There are callers who thrive on breaking the floor down. They want to prove that they know more than the dancers. We had a caller in our area who was thrilled when his entire floor was stopped and looking at him. So he could explain where they went wrong and what they didn't do that they were supposed to do. That thrilled him no end. Fortunately, he's not calling anymore, so that's okay. Personally, I don't believe in that. I believe the dancers want to be entertained with how much they know. They don't care how much I know. It's irrelevant to them. They want me to keep them dancing. They want to be happy. So how to soften the blow. I'm a big believer in clue words, not cue words. Help with direction, motions, or flow. If it's different, don't just give them the definition and expect them to figure it out. They won't. If it's different, they're in trouble. You need to help them. Referring to some of our examples, heads lead right and veer right. If you really feel the need to use that, break up the calls. Lead right. Smile, everybody. Now veer right. Oops. That was a smooth, but we got there. How about bend the line or reverse flutter wheel from a counterclockwise line? We talked about that. That's not a good flowing sequence at all. If you really feel the need to call that, if you want to be able to use that reverse flutter wheel, then do something after the before you, you do the reverse flutter wheel. After the bend the line, do a forward, come all the way back. Reverse flutter wheel, go boys. 
give them the clue. You don't have to give them the, how to tell them how to do the reverse flutter wheel. Just give them the clue to make sure they're successful at achieving it. Veer left or right from a forward motion. If you must call this again, proceed it with careful or listen up. Follow it with ouch, and they will groan. Maybe they'll even give you a laugh. But at least they'll know that you're aware that you called something that they had to think about. Partner trade and bend the line. There's total body reversal for either the end or the center, depending on whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. Again, you need to break up the calls with something. Forward and back or balance. And when I'm saying break up the calls, I'm not saying stop the action completely. The smile does stop the action completely. But you can do a forward and back from two face lines. It works and they'll giggle. They'll think that's pretty neat. Left swing through from a right hand ocean wave. That has nice flow and if it's set up correctly, but the dancers will fail in many cases. I usually say left and they'll think about it fairly quickly if you let them know. Wheel and deal from counterclockwise lines. As I said, it's often a bit of a challenge for some dancers. I'll usually follow it with go left or boy pivot, especially if they're newer dancers, basic and mainstream dancers. That's going to be totally foreign to them doing a wheel and deal from a counterclockwise line. I say uphill. unless you do it a lot. <laughs> What's that? I say uphill. Uphill. Yeah, that works, too. <laughs> I say uphill for a Ferris wheel. Hmm. In my opinion, the difference between fun and frustration is the success rate. That's all we're there for. We're there to entertain these people and give them an evening of dancing. If dancers are successful, they are usually happy, which makes it fun. Anything you can do to make them successful makes you successful. Flu words are very beneficial to the success. Don't be afraid to use these types of hints. Give them the direction, left, right. If it is unusual, use balance or forward and back. Say, woohoo! If it's an unusual line, let them enjoy it. Say some fun. Use do -si do as a direction neutralizer or smile to do a pause to neutralize the direction that you're going to use. It'll give you a pause. Yes, they'll stop the flow, but they're still doing something. They're not just standing there because they're waiting for you to call something. You've given them something to do. Smile at the corner. Smile at whoever you're looking at. That works. You know, before I open this up, I'm going to share a couple of stories with you. First off, um, I was hired many, many years ago by one of our area open dances. It was the Ottawa Fall Fest. And I'm not sure, but I think Mel might have even been there that year. I've been on that festival several times. It was a great festival. Only this year, they had changed one aspect of the festival. And they had called me about a month before the dance and said they were adding a component. And I said, oh, what's that? And they said, we want a competition prior to the opening ceremonies on Saturday night. I said, what do you mean a competition? And they said, well, we want you to call a competitive dance and have the dancers, as their square breaks down, they have to leave the floor. And I thought, <laughs> that totally goes against everything I believe in calling. But they insisted. There were three callers on staff. And the other two callers were both local callers. And the reason that they wouldn't pick either of them was because they felt that they would take a practice square and they would dance with them and they would get them all warmed up and get them dancing perfectly to their choreography so that they would win. So they had to choose the out-of-town guy. That was me. And I thought, okay, well, I mean, this is probably something I can get along with. They said, oh, by the way, you can't call anything off the mainstream program because we have dancers signed up from mainstream. And I thought, okay, this is going to be cool. And I thought, well, I can't site call because if you site call, obviously the, the squares you're sighting on are going to be the winners because you're going to keep them moving. And so I decided that I was going to write all the choreography and I wrote out all my choreography. And they called me the week before and they said, okay, everything's set up. We've got 26 squares signed up for the competition and you've got 15 minutes. I said, it'll be over in six. And they said, no, it can't be over in six. You've got 15 minutes. I got there, we called, it was over in four. 
I had nobody dancing in four minutes. I called nothing off the mainstream program. I did a lot of sashayed stuff. I did a lot of left-handed stuff, but they couldn't handle it. I had no idea the audience I was walking into. I had to just hope that some of this stuff was actually going to make people break down because I knew they had advanced dancers there because I was in the A2 hall at one point. And what happened at the very, the last two squares that were standing were advanced dancers. And my sequence for that particular one that they, that they actually died on was I said, ends fold, star through and pass through. And they did an ends bend and a star through and a pass through. And they were out of it. They were done. And so at the end of the four minutes, there's nobody dancing. There were no winners because the last two squares broke together on the same call. The executive comes up to me and he said, you have to do it again. I said, what? I said, it, like, it took four minutes. He said, well, we've got 15 minutes. We're not ready to start the opening ceremonies again. So you have to do it again. We're going to get everybody to square up and we're going to do it all over again. We did it all over again. This time it went for three and a half minutes. <laughs> it was pretty sad, really. I was not happy about calling and making sure that everybody died on the floor. That just wasn't a fun thing to do. And I don't think they've ever done it since. No. But somebody had I wasn't actually there for that, Jeff, but I did hear a lot of complaints about why the heck would they do something like that? Yeah. And the, the answer was they saw something about a square dance competition in the US where they have squares and they eliminate the teen dancers. They yeah. thought it would be fun. Nobody found it fun. They went to Los Angeles. They, they, that was what I was told. They were at the Los Angeles convention and they saw it there and they thought it would be great to bring home. And it, it really wasn't good. And uh, it was not something I enjoyed at all. Um, but it was in my contract. So that's the way it was. And the other story is uh, a good friend of mine was calling at a festival one night and he was doing a session called take no prisoners. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen those sessions, but, uh, those sessions are designed basically the same way. You take no prisoners. They just, he just keeps calling until there's nobody dancing anymore. And he did a stretch of 115 calls straight. Boom all plus level calls, one right after the other. They were dropping like flies. He was doing right-handed stuff. He was doing left-handed stuff. He was doing sashayed stuff. And it was just rolling off his tongue. He was just coming out with stuff. And nobody had ever, I've never seen anybody do that, that much to call that straight with no LMN laughs, no nothing, just 115 calls, boom, straight out. So there's differences in degree of difficulty. And like I said at the beginning, it's not discussed a lot because it's a personal thing. People get into arguments over what's difficult and what's not. Yeah. My personal feeling is that if you offer them help and you can make it fun, then the frustration is released. So you need to remove your degree of difficulty or reduce your degree of difficulty by helping them to be successful. And the more they're successful, the more fun they have. The more fun they have, the less frustrated they are. That to me is my whole goal. I like to make sure that they win. And that's what I, that's what I target for when I call. So there's a few other things that I say to warn them. Do what I call, not what you think I called. That's a big one. And that, you know, that makes them think a little bit or expect the unexpected or listen up. These phrases will alert them to be a bit more attentive to what I'm calling. They'll pay a little bit closer attention. Or afterwards, I might say, ouch, I'll try not to call that again. And after they groan, I will usually say, be nice, or I'll mumble. That usually gets a laugh. All right, let's open the session now. I want questions, comments, general discussion of experiences. Let us know something that you called that didn't go quite as you had planned, and maybe we can figure okay. out why. Well, before we open it up, Jeff, there was a number of questions. Oh, all um, right. You, you've answered four of them, but I've still got four left on the list. But before I get to those questions, let me turn um, off the share. We'll open the screen. Before now. I get to those questions, I want to say thank you very, very much uh, for the presentation. My the pleasure. notes and a copy of that presentation will be available, as will all that choreography uh, with the comments that Jeff has put up there so that you can have a look at it on um, Taminations or with your checkers, and you can actually see exactly what he's talking about. So the first question that came in was, um, how do you get past, this is when you were talking about degree of difficulty, 
how do you get past the caller evaluation of their own clubs? I faced a situation where I was told they were, sorry, I can't read my writing. They were good, solid, mainstream dancers learning plus, but when you get there, they can't dance mainstream. Wow. Um, it, de it depends, I guess, really on how the mainstream teaching is going and what is expected. I mean, if you're teaching standard application mainstream and they're going into plus and the plus caller expects them to know all position dancing, then it's not your fault if you've been told to teach standard application. I mean, that's what you have to deal with. If, if you're supposed to be teaching standard application plus extended application plus variations, that's a whole different story. It depends on your time frame. Depends on mm -hmm. how much time you've got to be able to teach all of that. So I guess really what, what that comes down to is you need to ask the club, if, if they're accusing you of that, you need to ask the club what it is exactly they expect. If they expect the full spectrum of the program so that they can go into plus and they already know everything from basic and mainstream from quote, dance by definition, then the plus caller can teach them whatever he wants or she wants. Mm -hmm. But if you're teaching standard application and they get to plus, and the plus caller expects them to know everything by dance by definition, and they don't, that's not your fault. You have to, the, the club has to decide, in my opinion, what it is they want you to do. And they need to let you know that. The next question came in when you were talking about if you have a teen club and then you have a group of 80 year olds mm -hmm. was, what do you do, Jeff? Do you slow down the timing or do you use less movements for older people? Um, I would usually uh, reduce my tempo. I, I do not believe in giving them more time than the music allows. Uh, so I will reduce my tempo so that they can actually dance on the beat of the music. For any of you who've danced to me, you know that when I call, uh, I call on the beat. You, you get the right number of beats to do every call. And the lead time is there so that it just rolls right into it. So when I have my teens... I usually run them at about 132 to 134 beats a minute. When I do my 80 year olds, we're running about 122, 124 max. So I just back my tempo down and give them, I can use the same choreography for both groups. The delivery is a little different. So you keep the timing, you just change the tempo. Correct. Okay. Um, I don't know if this was a question, you can chime in if I get this wrong. Uh, anything that causes the dancers to pause, stop, or change their minds or think about it increases the de degree of difficulty. That was it. it, it Questioner statement, but I guess they're just looking, is, it, is that what you mean? That's, that's a pretty fair statement. If, if, they're, if the flow is breaking up, if they're not successful in completing what it is you've called for any reason, or if they stumble and trip and fall then that increases the degree of difficulty, in my opinion. As I said at the beginning, it's not talked about a lot because degree of difficulty is a personal thing. You know, it's, if, you're, if, you, if you call C4, your degree of difficulty is almost non-existent because they're supposed to know all that stuff. I have a plus DBD group. My degree of difficulty in my plus DBD group is way different than it is in my plus teach group. Those people expect to be challenged. They expect me to give them things that are off the wall or a little bit different. That's what they're there for. So the degree of difficulty per se is much lower because th that's what they're working toward. Whereas if I do that in my regular plus club, the degree of difficulty is like sky high because they're not there for that. They're not expecting that. It's, it's, yeah. you've got to know your audience. And that's what I said. Your degree of difficulty is going to be based on who your audience is. And you've got to understand that that audience is what you've got to satisfy. They're the people you have to keep dancing. The people you had last night, different audience, different group. You can use the same choreography, but it's got to be presented very, very differently depending on who your audience is. These are things that as callers, we've all got to learn to figure out. Yeah. The last, the last one here is I've got a new dancer class. I prompt them through the movements. Can you cue? Sorry, I've got, I've got to scroll up here. <laughs> I was writing with go. Scroll up. <laughs> uh, 
Can you explain, uh, okay, I prompt them to get through the movement successfully. Can you explain what you mean between cue and clue? What's the difference? All right, if you're cueing, you're giving them the definition. We had a, we had a caller here years ago who, when he called, it, he did it more so in his advanced groups. When he called, he would recite the definition. He would give the call, recite the definition, and his dancers would go through it. That's cueing the call, all right? Um, I went in to call for his dancers one night and I called a chain reaction and they all stood there. And I said, you guys know chain reaction. He said, yeah, but he cues it. So you have to cue it to us. No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I did, but that's not the way it works. Um, you're supposed to know the routine of the calls. His dancers could not dance any of the advanced calls unless they were cued to it because they weren't forced to memorize anything. They weren't forced to know anything. He was cueing everything, all right? So the difference, you just wanna give them clue words. You don't wanna recite the whole thing to them. You know, if you're doing, for example, the Dixie style to a wave and you've got the boy in the right hand position, you awesome. say Dixie style to a wave, go boys. You don't tell them to do the right hand pull by and do a left touch a quarter with the lady across. You just say go boys and they should know the definition well enough to be able to get there, okay? So your cues versus clues, your clue is a quick hint, something that's gonna trigger the definition in their mind and understand that there are three definitions for every call on the Call Lab program. Three, count them, three, one, two, three. There is the true Call Lab definition. There is the definition that the caller has taught them because often we do recite the true definition, but then we give them hints. We give them other ideas that they can do to be able to do those calls. And then there's the definition that the caller create or the dancer creates in their own mind to be able to do that call. And if you ask them for their definition, it would probably be extremely different from the original call a lab definition hmm. because they, they create a floor pattern. Most dancers create a floor pattern. I'm a believer that we should not just teach straight standard application. I'm a believer that we should teach standard application and then extended application fairly soon afterward because dancers will create their own floor pattern. And if you put them in a different spot, they'll never be able to get it from any other direction. I was doing coordinate one night in my plus club and I did it after a circulate. I walked them through it. We walked them through it four or five times. I called it. Most of the room got it. This one little guy comes up to me and he says, I've been dancing 15 years. I've danced that call. I know that call. You kept putting me in the wrong spot. <laughs> that was his he had a floor pattern for that call and guess what where i put him it didn't work all right so the dancers do create their own stuff so you've got to understand that there's three definitions there that they're going to be figuring with so even if you recite and cue them it may still not work but if you can develop a clue that's going to help them start chances are they'll be able to finish on their own and the last comment was in the Oh, I've got another one just came in. Last comment that uh, was in the general chat was uh, one that Guga put down, which was in 2009, the Los Angeles competition. Tony Oxendine was calling. It was a competition. Two thirds of the square broke down on bow to your partner, bow to your corner, wrong way grand. Yeah. Two thirds of the floor. Yeah. Um, I, the question. <laughs> yeah. So the comment, which was related to your queuing, I hear that queuing is good for lessons to teach, but clues are what's given during a dance. That's a fair comment. That's a fair comment. Um, generally, I will recite the definition to them for the first two weeks that I'm teaching a new call. When, when they do it, when they, when I, in my teach clubs, I will teach the call, I will walk them through it. And then as they're doing it, for the rest of that night, I will give them all the cues or at least as many cues that fit and make sense in the time frame that they've got to actually dance the call. 
The next week I teach the call exactly as it was never taught before because of folks that missed last week are now getting it as a brand new teach. I will do the exact same process. After that point, I will start using clues instead of cues. I, I use, I call it weaning. You give them and then you wean yep. them off. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all the comments and questions. So as Jeff said, let's open the floor up to any comments, share your own experiences, things that you found that have helped, hindered or anything that you want to have. Uh, before we get into the open discussion, I do want to thank everybody for coming in. We're at the top of the hour. So if you've only allocated an hour, by all means, don't feel obligated to stay, but you are more than welcome to stay. And uh, let's have a big round of applause for Jeff for coming in and, and spending this time with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Appreciate now, it. Now, Jeff said he can only be here for another 11 hours. So yep. um, <laughs> <laughs> let's open the floor up to comments and questions. Anybody have anything that they would like to ask Jeff? I have a comment when you were showing these um, problems and um, difficulties and uh, used uh, the examples of your queuing. We, of course, where you don't speak English uh, natively, it's, uh, I'd say, even more important to not use bad queuing. I mean, what what's a pivot in Swedish for Swedish? What? <laughs> <laughs> What's uphill? Use the name of the call. Don't, don't make it worse. Mm. Do you do you not have a, a phrase or word for uphill? Oh yes, but uh, wow. we we try to. <laughs> but no one dancers would understand uphill if I called the uh, Wheatland deal from a left-handed to a face line. No, they wouldn't. Okay, well, fair enough. Yeah. It's it's a valid comment. You go to yep. one of the European yep. conventions and you use a standard clue word. It's going to have sixteen different meanings, and if that word is another word in a different language, because you could have six different language dancers on the floor. Yeah, yep. fair enough. Um, Larry put a comment in. I, I'm not sure if Larry's mic is working, but he said recently at U.S. Nationals, a caller in the SSD hall. Uh, was calling from offset formations, left-handed material, et cetera. So that in itself would give a, a certain degree of difficulty. No he kidding. said That's, that seemed like a bad idea in an SSD hall, but he's an experienced caller and a big proponent of SSD. Was that a good idea? I think he's just looking for your, your opinion on that matter. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a proponent of SSD to be sure, but uh, I would say that in the conversations I had with Jerry Story prior to his death, um, I, I don't think that that's exactly what he developed the program to be. So I'm not sure who that caller might have been. Um, but I think Jerry's idea was that, yes, you can kind of expand on it once you've had them dancing for a while. But I don't think the idea is to go into a convention hall and blow the floor away, which to me seems that that probably would have been the response to that particular application yeah. hard to, i wasn't there and I, I that's the first i heard about it as well and you are correct um when i we had a conversation here with jerry and the idea of the ssd program was expansion 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 on the development of these programs but it was based around the concept of you have a lot of people that come down travel and they want their summer dancing or their winter dancing they winter in florida or in the states Yep. And they're only there for 14 to 16 weeks, something that they can all learn, dance with, go back, take home, and, and just have a good time. So that's why it was a 12 to 16 week program. Uh, Larry just put in, yes, it was a rough tip. That was called. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> I'll bet. Jeez. And that's, you know, that's, again, that's the thing. You've got you've to look at your degree of difficulty for your audience. You've got to know who your audience is. Um, I, you know, you could probably get away with that in a plus hall, a full-blown plus hall. And it probably wouldn't, the degree of difficulty would be much lower than it was in the SSD hall. But again, it's yeah. caller judgment. And that's what we started off saying. It's this, this topic does not get a lot of discussion because it's very personal. You know, what I think may be very difficult, you may not think is difficult at all. Again, mm -hmm. you've got to know your audience. And for me, 
the rule is the dancer has to be successful. And whatever I can do to make the dancer successful will reduce the frustration level. And that's my objective. These people are in a, they're in a recreation. They're out there to have fun. They're not out there to get hammered. I mean, I like to play video games. I don't like to lose them. I mean, if I get, if I get to a level where I just continually get hammered, I don't play the game anymore. It's not fun. There's no point. Yeah. And, and that's I like me, me playing Halo with my son. They taught yeah. me how to play it. And then uh, every 16 seconds, he snipes me from somewhere. So I just quit playing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, one of the comments that came in, and, and I'd like to expand on this, is the lowest common denominator is always a tricky thing. And you, you made a comment, and I would, wouldn't mind you expanding on it. If you're calling, say, at a convention and you're in the basic hall, but because you've got that or like in this SSD hall, which is probably the case, you've got dancers from A2 all the way down or even challenge all the way down that can dance the basic program. There's a right. tendency to sweep the level higher uh, in that program because you're calling to the floor and you're right. forgetting that you may only have 20 basic dancers in the hall, but you got 200 dancers on the floor. There's Even, that tendency. So you have to really pay attention to what the program is and what program you're calling to the lowest common denominator. That's exactly that's correct. Yeah. Program yeah. denominator or dance capability denominator? No, program. If it's... We used to have the TND convention up here, and I was the programmer for that convention mm -hmm. for 25 years. And our rule to the callers was you call the program. If the dancers can't dance the program, they go to a different hall. If the dancers aren't happy with that program that you're calling, they go to a different hall. In the basic hall, you call basics. If you've got challenge dancers there, I don't care. You do not call to the challenge dancers because they'll, they'll dance anything you want. But the beginners, the basic dancers, are there for basic, and they want to have their fun. You call the level of the floor, and that is it. You do not cater to the hot shots. And unfortunately, you know, you get you get callers at a convention where they get followed around. Dancers follow them around. I know I've been there, but when they get in and they get all their all their cronies and all their friends in one hall, and it's a level two or three below from where they normally dance, they tend to cater to those, and you can't do that. You have to yeah. use the common denominator, which is the program that you're actually called, actually hired to call, right? Um, again, that's my opinion. There's, there's callers who don't believe that. They want to keep, my rule of thumb is I like to have 80% of the floor moving 100% of the time. I, I will allow for some failures because there's going to be failures. There's always going to be failures. You know, somebody wasn't thinking, somebody didn't hear the last call or whatever. There's always going to be some failures, but I like to have 80% of my floor moving hundred percent of the time. And that's what I strive for. Jeff, you were saying you change your t uh, speed or, or the tempo. Yep. So uh, in addressing this same question and in that same hall, would you alter your tempo to suit the newer dancers in the hall? Absolutely. A lot, a lot of it boils down to judgment, really, and, which is another topic that has that we everybody's did. got That's a different opinion <laughs> on what judgment is. Um, yeah, but you know, it, it's we a common question that occurred in, in a lot of these themes is uh, if I go to the hall and I've got you know twenty squares on the floor, but I've got a square that just doesn't seem to get it. Do I change it so that everybody succeeds, or do I make that decision and write that square off? And a lot of that will come to judgment, but if you, if I think your comment on if you've got a program, if it's a basic hall and it's an open convention or something like that, it's a basic hall. You look at your level as if it was new graduate basic dancers. Correct. Take a step back and build up to where their capability is. Judge the floor as you go along, but you've got to watch an entire floor to do that. Now that I mean to say that that doesn't mean that I don't add a little bit of degree of difficulty. It's a festival. Hmm. Uh, I'm a different caller from what they normally dance to, but I've, I have, I will have stuff prepared that I will be able to help them through. And I mean, I, I'm sure that many of you have danced to Lee Kopman. Now Lee Kopman called some of the most challenging stuff in the world, but he could get a floor through anything just in the way he called, just in the manner of the way he did it and just the way he set it up. And he didn't give you all the definitions. 
As a matter of fact, he very seldomly ever used a definition, <laughs> except his own. But um, there are ways that you can introduce, as I said, it, it might be difficult. Will it affect everybody? Not necessarily. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But you can, you can get the beginner dancers in that beginner hall that are surrounded by plus advanced and challenged dancers to make them feel good that they've accomplished something different. And you can just help them through that. And if you've got a program built or if you've got your, your system set up, and, and by the way, if you're going to do something like that, I would strongly recommend that you prepare it in a module. That you have your module all ready to go and you use your module. And in your module, write your clue words. Put it right there, what you're going to say, so that you don't forget. You don't forget where it is you want to help them. Absolutely. And that will make them really successful. And they will feel really good about it. I've, I've seen, seen here in a lot of the presentations where we looked at cue sheets. We did a session on cue sheets and how people present them. And even on their singing calls, and you'll see me do it when, we, when we're looking at Taminations a lot, they put in brackets, italicized or something, something that they're going to clue. Like mm -hmm. you're in a left-hand ocean wave, swing through boys start or girls start or whatever it is that allows you to do that as a prompt to you, usually in a different color. So it stands out that that is a consistent clue word yeah. or, or an issue. Uh, and a lot of callers do that. It is a good idea because sometimes you need it, but it also, because it's there, it allows you to see it's different. You can opt to use it. And if they're doing fell, you can opt not to use it. It's not going to change the program. That's right. I mean, I do, I, as I say, I've got a DBD club and, and they expect a lot of different stuff. And I, and I write a lot of modules. Matter of fact, I've just produced another book on plus DVD sequences. And in, in my sequences for that, I write all of my teaching sequences. I write them because I want to know that when I call Alaman left, it's correct. Because some of these people are doing these calls for the first time and they break down. They're going to break down. And I want to make sure that those that don't break down, I'm not citing on somebody and all of a sudden they go down. I've got my sequence already there. And I will write in it, for example, if we're going to do a spin chain and exchange the gears, and I've done it after a touch a quarter, then my, I will put in brackets beside it, BGBG, BG, so I know it's boy, girl, boy, girl. I know that it's an unusual spin chain and exchange of gears. Or if I've got the boys in the middle, it'll be GBBG, BG, and it's in brackets. I know that. That's to help me so that if I have to lead them, I can. If I can give them clue words from there, then I can do that. And I'll do that with most of the stuff that I write that's off the wall or that's a little bit different so that I've got a clue coming up. I can see that more than two or three calls ahead so I know what's going to happen. I'm just putting the link to the Canadian College College and uh, whatnot for access to not only the school, but a lot of the material and resources that you have available. So I put that into the chat. Thank you. Cool. Uh, anybody have any questions, comments, want to share some of their experiences of what went really well, what went really bad? I know I've had a lot of really bad stuff. We were talking about <laughs> some of that at the beginning of the evening. <laughs> My first was I was overprepared and I was feeling overconfident. And yes, you can be overprepared and overconfident. Oh. Um, you know, I knew it all worked. The dance worked. They danced it, but there was no emotion. There was no feeling in it. And uh, that, that, I mean, that's a whole different, different ball game, but it's, you yep. know, we've all had that kind of experience. And it is, you know, back in, back years ago, when I was doing a lot of traveling through the U.S., the U.S. used to have three different plus programs. They had standard plus, they had soft plus, and they had all position plus. That's what we used to call it. Not, we didn't call it dance by definition. It was called all position dancing. And so when you got hired to call for one of the plus clubs, I had to ask, what's the level of the club? And, you know, you're talking to the guy who's, who's on the executive who's probably been dancing for quite a few years. And they say, oh, no, we dance at all. We dance everything. We, no problem. You can, you can throw anything at them. And you get down there, and your first tip is a complete total disaster because they're standard application. They don't know anything else but. And 
you know, you really have to. So I learned from that, that my first tip always in a strange dance, first off, it's memorized routines, memorized modules that I open up with for my first tip, because I know it all works. And from that, I can pick out who the good dancers are, if I'm going to be sight calling. And I can also determine fairly quickly what degree of plus they actually know, what level they truly are. Um, and, you know, we still have that issue now, even, even up here, we have that issue because there are some callers who only call standard position, period. That's it. That's all. They don't, they don't ever stray out of that. And of course, when their dancers go to an open dance and they get somebody like me who likes to call stuff that's just a little bit different, um, they have issues. So that's where I develop my clue words and I can pick them out pretty quickly. You know, when you're on a stage and you're calling, it's like a, it's like a big kaleidoscope and you don't have to look at any one square. I mean, primarily I'm a site caller, except for my teach clubs where I use my modules. But you look around the room and if there's a, if there's a square or a couple stop, they're instant. You see that instantly if you're on a stage because your kaleidoscope just broke. Those are the things you need to be aware of. And you need to log that in your mind as to where, when that happened and what happened and then go back and do it again and see if you get the same result or if it was just kind of a hiccup. Might have just been a hiccup. Maybe they didn't hear it. Maybe they missed something. Maybe they were talking to somebody. But those things are all stuff that you have to learn on the go as you're, as you're going. You know, it's, it's this, this degree of difficulty thing really is group by group, night by night, caller by caller. It's different to all of us. What I've presented to you is, are the things that I feel create degree of difficulty. And I've tried to offer some suggestions on how you can lessen the frustration level by helping them out a little bit. There's always going to be difficulties. There's always going to be squares break down. That's just the way of life. Like the guys with the hockey game, they wanted to watch hockey. The wife wanted to dance. He lost, you know, he's not listening. He's not paying attention. Every break he runs out and he listens, turns on the radio in the car so he can hear what's going on with the game, you know? So. Uh, we had a uh, dance uh, about 15, 20 years ago that it was a mainstream, main, or, I'm sorry, a plus club because in our area, it's all this is plus. And the caller got up there and he called mainstream. And he would call like an AC Ducey, he would say, Center straight and circulate, and they would break down because yeah. they knew it was an AC Ducey, but it was called backwards, and yeah. they were going like, "What's going on?" And they broke down. Like he he was having a blast, and then he told me, "He says I'm calling you mainstream. This is what you're supposed to know. These are the plus calls that make up the main. This is the mainstream calls that make up the plus calls, and we're putting them together. So." Let's pay attention and dance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a, a that is. Uh, you made a comment earlier in one of one of your um, examples. There are callers that take a great joy in showing how smart they are or how clever they are. Yeah. Or in 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 the case you presented, John, I've seen that a lot as well, where it it comes to a point you want to call, you want to show them what they know but you end up talking down to the dancers. And once you cross that line, your degree of difficulty for the entire evening has just increased exponentially, yeah. but it has nothing to do with your choreography. It has to do with the, I think, what was it? Number nine or 10, the atmosphere, atmosphere. that you yeah. just created in, in the, in the, um, the dance. Yeah. You've turned That's off true. the receptors because now they just don't want to, they don't want to play with you. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Well, I, I, I like. Was, I was. I was a dancer back then. I wasn't a caller at the time, and I mean, it was like you know, I had no problems because it was plus it was the mainstream calls and all. And I was just getting into getting into the plus calls at the time, and then the breakdown. It was it, to me. I was going like, "What's going on here?" <laughs> you know. I mean, I've watched. I think I watched callers. Um, there used to be a caller. I think he's still alive, actually. Johnny Hendren. No. Johnny Hendren was one of the smoothest callers I have ever danced to. And we used to have him 
I mean, he'd been in our convention a number of times. And I would watch that man float 125 squares in the main gym. And, they, and he called nothing. He called nothing. They absolutely loved the man. And he, you danced to him. And I mean, the whole floor just floated together. And when he called sides face grand square, everybody moved at exactly the same time. When he called a teacup chain, everybody moved at exactly the same time. It was just outstanding to watch this man call and to dance to him. We don't do that anymore. We don't have callers like that anymore. Now, now it's all choreography based. You know, it's how much can you give them? How many calls can you give them in, you know, in one, one sequence that are the level they're dancing? And, you know, it's kind of unfortunate in a lot of ways that we've lost the dance aspect of it. Yes. I don't think anybody will disagree with that. Um, Daryl Clendenin always uses an expression, different, not difficult. Right. And that's what we want to achieve. There is yep. a certain amount of difficulty. There's a certain amount of, of progress that goes through that. But a little bit different adds that sense of difficulty without making it difficult. And that little bit of difference makes all the world between an enjoyable dance and a dance that you're just going through the motions and you can't wait for it to be over. Yep, exactly right. Can I add something? I think it, uh, one of the most important things is flow. When you talk about smoothness and flow, and I remember there was a new dancer at my club who has been away at a convention. I don't know who the caller was or what he actually did, but I understood that it had been really fast. And she came back and said, oh, it went so fast that we didn't have any time to do any uh, errors. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a nice thought. Yeah. <laughs> Don Beck had an expression that happened to him very similar. Uh, he had a dancer come up to him and he says, oh, you're a fast caller. And immediately he was on the defensive saying, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going too fast for these guys. We usually dance a lot slower, but, and I can't dance that, but I can dance to your stuff. I like it. Yeah. And, and, and it is exactly the same comment. If it flows and it feels right, chances are you could call woogity boogity wapity splash. If, if their dance flow is right and you set them up correctly, they're going to be partway through exactly what you want them to do before they even realize what you've called, because it's just a natural progression. Yep. I, I often get that at a lot of festivals. People come up and say, man, you call fast, but it just flows. We, we just roll right along. And I'm thinking, well, I don't call fast. I call on the beat. I make you dance on the beat. And I deliver the mm -hmm. call so that you can step in time with the music, because that's what it's supposed to be all about. And so it's not a matter of calling fast. It's just what that tells me is that their caller calls, they stop, he calls, they stop, he calls, they stop. And, you know, it's, they don't have a real wind in your face type experience. There's a comment that just got posted to me. It says, what do you mean you don't slow it down? You slow the tempo, not the timing. <laughs> what was that? Uh, there's a comment on... You don't slow it down. You change the tempo. Isn't that slowing it down? And, and we, we've done a number of sessions on the difference between tempo and timing, or temp, sorry, tempo and speed would be a better way. But tempo and timing are two different ball games completely. Yes, tempo is, is, is the count of the beats and how many of those there are in a minute. The timing is if you've got 16 beats, to do a movement, you use 16 beats. Whether or not those 16 beats are at 122 or 128, it's still 16 beats. And if timing. You're not if you're not Sorry, delivering the call at the correct lead time for the next call, then yeah. you're not flowing. Yeah. You're not working to the music. Yeah. And there are a couple of really good sessions on tempo and timing. There's also a good session there on the three aspects of timing your command, your lead time, your command time, and your execution time, and how they work together. Um, they're all there, but that could be another session in itself that we uh, we could talk about, and we can get maybe get you back to talk about that one, Jeff, sometime well, in the maybe future. Maybe we could. Yeah. <laughs> um, does anybody have any more questions for Jeff or comments? Uh, the floor is open. 
And Alan, you're looking very serious. I thought it was a very good presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Alan. My pleasure. Yeah, no, um, I, I like your clear and um, simple analysis of what what goes into the elements. Yeah, very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Jeff, it was a very, very, very nice and informative uh, presentation. Thanks, sorry, Jeff. I missed, I'm sorry I missed the other night. Well, my weather, daughter's wedding had an after party. I wasn't oh, nice. up to time to get to you. <laughs> so, so, you're, so what you're saying is rather than you know, go to a session with Jeff, you decided to go to your daughter's wedding. Oh, yeah. no, that, that, that would have been a that would have been a hard decision to make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't have any choice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, as always, we will be posting the video. Or Mark will be posting the video online. Uh, he had to go out. He's got a, a dance to deal with. Uh, he had to go up, but he will be posting the video online and a copy of the uh, presentation that Jeff has done will also be there. So you can go through and actually look at that choreography at your own time and see exactly what he's talking about as far as flow and everything else goes. And that will be going up when the video goes up. Alan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to ask Jeff to comment on choice of music affecting difficulty. Um, it can, for sure. Uh, it depends on, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're going to do a, a piece of music um, that normally should run at 132 beats and you're going to back it down to 122, it's going to sound like garbage. <laughs> yeah, so you need to, you need to be aware of that. Um, there's, there's certain music that you can use for different groups. Um, there's certain music you can use for every group. Um, sing-alongs generally are good for any group, even, even teens. The teens like the sing-alongs. Um, but if you've got stuff that's going to bang out at 132 or 134 beats a minute, if that's the way it was designed, uh, it's not something that I would generally use for my 60, 70, 80 year olds, unless it's something that you can back down a bit, change your, change your tempo on it a bit and still have it sound fairly decent. Um, but other than that, yes, music, music can affect your difficulty, especially if you're using a piece of, of, um, hoedown music that is one of the newer pieces of music um what they call alternative music if you're using any of those things if you've got something that's got vocals in it and you're going to do some choreography that could present some issues don't use that piece of music because the vocals will interfere with your commands and your clues um, you want to be able to use if you're going to work something that's that's what I would consider challenging, let's say that. Um, you want to use a piece of music that's clean, that has a good solid beat to it, and it just kind of rolls along and doesn't have a lot of heavy instrumentation that's going to confuse the dancer. Because what you'll find is, um, if, it's, if it's one of these really, you know, like Chaka Chaka or, you know, any of the, any of the real movers that they use, the dancers tend to kind of lean to the music. They listen to the music and they try and dance to the music. And if you're delivering commands or if you're doing something that's a little bit challenging, they're, they, don't, they don't stand a chance. They're going to miss it. So, yes, music can have a dramatic effect on your degree of difficulty, depending on what it is you're doing. I tend to find our, our younger, newer callers tend to use extremely busy and heavy, if you like, with instrumentation stuff. Yeah. Because I, I feel it's sort of putting them back behind the ball before they start to some extent for that reason yeah yeah i use that stuff for party nights when it's just going to be straight straight stand-up dancing and just just let them roll just let them feel the music and dance to the music that's when i use that kind of stuff or i'll use it on my last tip of the evening um or maybe the first tip of the evening if i want to start off with a party night I'll, I'll give them something that's really rowdy and i won't call anything that's tough i won't give them any reason to falter for, yeah, I, I personally don't like any vocals in my pattern music. I, uh, I, I, I very strongly dislike it. Yeah, uh, but I developed that I can I wish I had the record there was a piece of music that was out in 1983 84 that had vocals in the pattern it was the start of this alternate music trend. Mm -hmm. And I was dancing in Germany. 
And that's when I found out that when you have vocals and somebody's calling in English and your background vocals are in English and not everybody speaks English, it created a problem because you had to listen not only to a language, but interpret a language and everything else. Yeah. Now that was a completely different nuance, but I took that to heart and I said, I will, I will try never to use a piece of pattern music that has vocals in it. Yeah. Because it's, I want there, them listening to me, not, not somebody else. There are some you can work with. Um, yeah. Tennessee Waltz, the new Tennessee Waltz. Uh, is not English. The vocals are not in English. And they've actually, the vocals are kind of buried, but they're not, I mean, they're there, you can hear them. Um, but it's a female singer. And so with a male voice giving the calls and the fact that the vocals are not in English, the people tend to hear the caller more often than not. You, would you use that as a patter though? I use it as a patter, yes. Oh, okay. Absolutely. That's a great piece of patter music. I'll tell you something else I use is pattern music. Uh, my wife is a round dance cure and I use a good number of her chas. Her chas are perfect for pattern music. Back them down a little bit. Um, a lot of the chas that she's got are, are out at maybe 136, 38, but you can back them down to 124, 126, no problem. It doesn't change it that much. So they're good to use. I may have to do some rethinking. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I personally don't like vocals in my pattern, but yeah, I'll have a listen. Yeah. They're not bad. It depends on on uh, on what the mm. vocals are. I mean, there's a couple of alternative vocals, uh, music out there that have got vocals on it. You don't want people to hear because some of them are just not nice words. There's a, there's a couple of guys that are using some stuff out there that they really shouldn't be using mm. because the, the vocals are just, they're they're horrible. Yeah. Well, it's like my son was driving in the car. He says, turn that up. That's, oh, it's my favorite song. And I asked him what it's about. And he told me, I don't know. I haven't seen the video yet. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing. Good plan. It may have a nice beat and a nice rhythm, but you better yeah. know what the words and the lyrics are. Exactly. Yeah. So does anybody have any more questions or comments for Jeff? Well, I have a question, but it's like totally off topic. Okay, go. Okay, Jeff, with your core 20 that you do, if I wanted to teach that core 20 to a set of people and then wanted to have dances with that core 20, if I wanted to teach specific calls so that I could use uh, three extra calls that night, what would be the max number of new calls that you would teach in that one night where you could get those people dancing, they already know the core 20, you're gonna teach them, I don't know, X number of calls so that you can include those. Um, and then like the next week when you call to dance, you would know they all they know is the core 20 and then you would maybe add some different calls in. What's the maximum number of new calls you would add in one night? How many tips hey, you Jeff, do? Jeff, before you answer that, can you yep. just give us a quick explanation on core 20 for those of us that may or may not be familiar with it? And then oh, okay. The core 20 is, is my teaching basic system where there are 20 core calls that um, you teach once you've taught the 20 core calls and there's a specific teaching process to do that in the book. It's all laid out. Then the rest of the book has got all the rest of the basic calls using each page only uses one call, one new call, use, utilizing the core 20 to get you there and get you out. Okay. So you can teach the basic program in any order that you choose once you've taught my core 20. Now that's a system I've used for more than 30 years and it works. It really does work. Um, Janet, how many tips are you gonna do that night? There's usually about seven tips a night. Then I would say no more than three. It might be pushing it depending on the call that you choose. Um, two would be probably very comfortable. You do a warm up tip at the beginning um, then you do a review tip for number two and you kind of go through all of the, all of the core 20 to make sure they're comfortable with everything. And then in tip three, you would teach a new call. Tip four, you would go ahead and review that new call. Tip five, you could teach another new call. Tip six, you could review that new call. And then tip seven would be your, your say good night, a relaxing tip. Uh, not including your two new calls because they haven't had enough practice on them yet, but making sure you include everything in the core 20. Okay. That's when you do would, this, that's the, the second, when you teach the second new call of the night and you do that, the review of that, 
would you add or have that first call that you taught in that review? So you're using both new calls in that second review? You could, depending on their success rate and depending on the complexity of the call. Okay. I mean, if, it, if it's one of the more simpler calls, then yes, by all means. Um, if they're both mm -hmm. calls they have to work at, I mean, if you're, if you're doing a square through and swing through, um, they're, they're pretty potent calls on their own for new dancers. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't combine them if it were me um, in, the, in the second review tip. Although you might be able to, depending on, on, I mean, if you've got 30 somethings in there, yeah, no problem. If you're dealing with 60, 70, 80 year olds, you might have an issue. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, is the link to your Core 20 book, is that on the Caller's College uh, website? Okay. Yep. Yeah, so that we're link all, I put down is the Yeah. They're under, uh, they're under the tab that says Caller's Helpers. Um, the first item is, uh, is Teaching Books. And if you open that, then you get another screen that has the books all listed. And if you click on the book, uh, then it opens up a new page and it shows you the way the book is laid out. Um, and you can scroll through. There's, I think there's eight or 10 figures of, from each book there. I've just posted that link in the chat. Well, Jeff, uh, we seem to have come to that pregnant pause in the session. Here I want to thank you very, very much <laughs> for coming in and doing the session for us. My pleasure. Uh, as always, you are more than welcome. And it's really good to see you and my best to you and the family as well. And I'm glad you got a break from the uh, the chicken farm, the gaggle, the hen's night. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. My, my but, wife is one of five girls and my brother-in-law calls them the coven. <laughs> yeah, they will be back. <laughs> yes, they will be back. <laughs> okay. okay, all Jeff's material is available on the Canadian Callers website. Uh, Jeff, um, you can also email Jeff if you have any things directly, uh, any questions. He does make himself available for those kinds of things. And if you do have any questions, just uh, send him an email. I believe your contact web address and email details are also available on that website. Yes, they are. Uh, so and the books, once the again. Books have the books have all been just newly updated. Um, I've just had a reprinting done of all of them. Um, and we've made a few changes because we had to update because the programs changed. So we had to move some stuff out of the basic book into the mainstream book. And then we had to add triple scoot to the plus book. Um, so those things have all been, those adjustments have all been made and the books are all freshly reprinted. So. Okay. Once again, a big hand for Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff, for coming in. Thank you. It is, as always, very, very much appreciated. Uh, thanks to Mark Hart, who unfortunately had to leave us. He's got to dance, but he looks after putting all of the material up on the website. That's the OC Callers website at www.occallers.com. All this session, all the supporting material and all the previous sessions that when we started recording about two and a half, three years ago, uh, they're all there as well as links to other callers information. And, uh, that is it for this. We'll just open the floor Larry, up to general chit chat and socialization. Larry had his hand up there for a minute. I oh, just, sorry. I, I, I down, but I, completely. Larry, did you have something you wanted to ask? I think Larry may have left us. I missed that completely, Larry. I am sorry if I missed your hand up. I know you posted something in the chat earlier. Uh, that was regarding the SSD tip. Oh, no, he says no question. Uh, oh, okay. no, Larry just said no question. I think yeah. Larry's mic's okay. not working. All right, fair enough. Chris, did you get frustrated enough tonight or what? <laughs> I'm not used to seeing you without the eye patch, Chris. <laughs> you muted. muted, can't hear you. Yeah, I just took it off for a sec. <laughs> You're, you're, you're shying away from doing the pirate theme dances now, are you? That's what the little, what the little boy next door thinks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if nobody has any more questions, I want to say thank you to everybody for coming in. To all of our American friends, I hope you have a great uh, Fourth of July long weekend, Independence Day for you, and uh, enjoy the weekend. Stay safe, everybody. 
there is no session next week. Uh, the following week, I may be deployed to deal with the Varroa mite issue with the bees here in Australia. Uh, I'm talking with Mark. He may or may not run a session on the 17th. It was going to be Eric Tangman talking about uh, some of the changes that he's made to using square view and, and the uh, choreographic displays, but that session has been now moved to uh, the subsequent month and that'll be out on the schedule. So stay tuned. There is no session next week. The following week will be addressed and it may or may not. So stay tuned um, and have a look on Facebook in either the new callers, the newbie callers, callers in training to see if it does get posted there if Mark does not get the email invitations out. I'll try and figure that out as soon as possible and get that out to everybody. Um, for those of you that were having a little bit of trouble with the links getting in, uh, I do not know what is going on with the link. Uh, for some people it's working, for some people it's not on the email link, but the links in Facebook and whatnot do seem to be working, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge. So uh, we in post case, this on. In case people don't realize when you go to log in Zoom, if you actually type in the code, and everything. Next time you get in, if you hit join meeting, it will bring up a drop down list and you can just pick the same code all the time and it will log you in. So I never That's have to type it in a second time because it remembers yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and this this is a static uh, meeting. It's it's a fixed meeting. Every It's scheduled for every Sunday, but uh, we're switching to every second Sunday, but I'm not going to change the codes and resources because a lot of people have been linked, just like Janet's saying. Yeah, Mel, when I went to use this last one, I couldn't get in either. So I just went to a previous email and got in that way. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. Jeff suggested it might just be something with the providers or the, or the networks or something like that. I don't understand why it would work for some and not for others. Could be something local or regional. I just used Maybe it was too market. close to the March schedule because I also had problems. Um, I had the link um, on a little uh, page where I um, saved it uh, because I usually delete all the emails because I'm getting hundreds of emails with the committee work. And so I didn't have one last email, but finally I um, had that saved link. But I wasn't sure what it's going to work because we had some interference um, uh, last year uh, when I thought we changed something, but uh, if not, I was lucky. I don't know. Usually I hit the link and then Zoom pops up and I just say, yes, I want to enter. So I don't have to give in any code or whatever, but it didn't work this time. Yeah, well, that's that's the way I had set it up initially. And I still have yeah. the same Word document that I did several years ago. I, I just update the details and copy and paste it into the emails that I send out and on, on the uh, web pages. So I really I just, don't uh, know what's happening. Um, from Barry Watson. At some point. Um, yeah. and I just click on the same bookmark every time. Yeah. From Barry Wanson, the latest edition of Behind the Mic magazine is out. Uh, I'll be posting that as soon as I get it posted up on the website, as soon as I get that, that you can find that at behindthemic.com. Uh, it's got a lot of interesting articles in there. And if, if you are interested in submitting any articles or uh, that for uh, caller training or of interest to callers, by all means, just send Barry or myself an email and, uh, we go through them and they can get put into Behind the Mic magazine. There are a lot of caller resources magazine. I don't know if you guys are still doing the TND note service, Jeff? No. No, no unfortunately, that was a good one. No, yeah, it was a good one, but no, TND is not, uh, they're no longer publishing a, a note service. Hmm. So, and uh, just a little note from the music producers, a few of them are looking. Um, Paul Cote is, he's the one that, uh, I believe he has bought Ego and Alter Ego Records. So he now owns that label. You know, Paul Cote and... just sold them. Oh, he just sold them. They were his labels. He just sold them. Oh, I thought he just got them. No. Nope. No, no. He no, sold no, no. them. He sold them. Who did he they sell were... them to? He sold them to, uh... oh, geez. One of the guys in California who's already got two other labels. Uh... I don't know. Oh, I just I just saw a thing on Facebook. I, I must have misread it. I do yeah, apologize no. for that. No, he sold them. He's trying to sell Hilton too. If anybody wants yeah. to buy it. Yeah. And but if, he did sell it to Buddy Weaver or what's that? Did he sell no. the record label to Buddy Weaver? No. No, no. Okay. No. No. Um yeah. 
Oh, shoot. I didn't see this announcement. Where was it? Uh, it, was something, it was on oh. Facebook. But one of the things I wanted to mention is um, a lot of work has gone into the development of Hilton. It has been the big mainstay for square dance calling, for round dance calling, for a lot of things over the years. Um, the problems with Hilton is they're so damn good, they very rarely break down. And it is an expense that callers do have. The same with our music producers. It's an expense that the music producers do have. The costs are going up, but this is an activity that we all love and we do need to support uh, you know, organizations like Hilton or the producers of the material, the music producers that we have. So have a look, get on some of those websites. There is a lot of really good new music out there. There's a lot of uh, some of the older music that's being released and digitized, some of the old favorites. Have a look, go through them, look for sales, talk to the music producers, and they may be able to put a bundle together for you. Um, I know guys like Rick Hampton and uh, that, Bob Elling and various others are very, very good at that. Um, same with Tracy Brown. They've got a lot of material up there. Have a look. Who is Refresh. Rick Hampton's, who's Rick Hampton's Rick partner? Hampton the um, Rod Shooping. Rod Shooping is who bought um, the Leckroot labels. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's Rod. Now I have an idea for you uh, for a topic, uh, and that mm -hmm. is, even though I haven't been calling all that long, I'm finding myself mentoring some other people that are interested in learning to call. And so we've been meeting by way of Zoom to work on things. But a session on mentoring uh, is something I would like to see. Hopefully you'd have it on a week I could actually attend. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we, we can do that. Mentoring has been one of the mainstays of these sessions um, when, we, when we talk about it. That's why we try and scale these to three different levels. One is for the new caller to gain foundation material and have the material so they can self-develop. Two is for the journeyman caller to, exper uh, to expand their skills. And number three is for really experienced callers that they can take what they can from these lessons and use them as tools to assist them in developing new callers. Um, there are a couple sessions back in, in the recordings. One is um, the difference between criticism and critique and mentoring and uh, they're very very good sessions uh, a lot of experienced callers really mean well but they don't understand the difference between critique and development and they have constructive no criticism they have, or criticism they have no bedside and, manner yeah well I'm, I'm not as politically correct as you jeff <laughs> i say things very straight but that's an excellent topic it's something that we could probably spend about six months just developing those skills yeah no kidding on uh, mentoring and on teaching in general, um, if you're going to mentor, m my thoughts are you should be able to teach and then teach the teachers because that's what we're talking about. And um, Ken Rattusi has a school, it's called the Teaching College. It's, it's part of his chain, but it's along that line. And he would definitely be a person to get a hold of for material thoughts and ideas. And I think that's a great topic suggestion. And uh, I'm going to look into it and see what I can develop for you. I think if you, um, if you go to the Cololab uh, knowledge database, uh -huh. Cololab, I believe that they have a paper on mentoring. I know. Yeah, that... I, I have that paper, but the, okay. like the one thing we doing is, is she had told me that she was going to go to the caller school at nationals. And so I just said, okay, we need to start with terminology. So when they're spewing all this terminology at you, you at least know what they're talking about and everything. So right. that's yeah. kind of where we started. And I like teaching. That's my favorite part of the, the square dance calling aspect. Um, and she's a teacher. So it, it works out really well uh, to, to do that. But it's just kind of like a path. But I've noticed that Caller Lab doesn't have... Um, what I would consider very, very basic teaching, learning, because if they're, if they're were a dancer and they're wanting to learn to call, like there's no terminology list uh, to, if she had a hold of old material, what a one P, P two P line was, it's now called 
a partner line. And so just a terminology list does not exist out there to tell people, because I've got a lot of material that's old material and I mm. keep having to figure out what the terminology is today you're, out of okay. that book. So you're yeah. talking Yolanda, about, about three about years ago, <laughs> you had this same question. I sent you a list of all of these things. I don't have it anymore because I lost. Do you still have that list? I have Somewhere in the art. Oh, you have a I, list? I have a I, list in one. Yeah, in one of our, uh, certainly in all of my syllabus that we do at color schools, we have a list of the Lippmann process and the color lab process, which, which it correlates the two of them. Um, I mean, we used to call what they call a zero box. Now we used to call a one, four box it used to be a quarter box. Um, you had a three, two box. They now call across the street box. Um, I have, I can send you that. If you send me your email, send me an email and I will send it back to you. Okay. Well, Jeff, that'll, Jeff, if you want to send it to me yep. as well, I can get it posted on the uh, website as well. Okay. Yeah, no problem. That would be good because when Yolanda and I started, we had a lot of trouble with that. Yeah, what you, what you, yeah, most new callers have that. What you're saying, Janet, is is a frustration that a lot of new callers have had over time, and e even still today, uh, you'll be in a session, and somebody will be talking about a zero box or a zero line, and then somebody else will be talking about, some, and it's just the terminology they're used to. We did an entire session on the terminology of square dancing and things like Fazar. They are references for understanding. And it's one of our biggest failings as caller mentors is, and even at Caller Lab, there is a general assumption that the basic premises of what is known is known to everybody. And that's where they start. And that's usually where the biggest frustration and the biggest off switch is. Yeah, because once you start getting into I'm, I I don't know what you're talking about, I stop listening, and when you stop listening, you just sort of sit in the background and because there's no questions, people tend to think it's understood. It's an excellent excellent idea and probably a couple of sessions, Janet. Somebody yeah, should probably. make a little uh, a, a little uh, sheaf of uh, printouts that are that don't have too much information on them, but like for example the the correspondence of the of the you know of the whatever four different. Uh, eras of, uh, of naming things, but, uh, but you won't need, uh, but uh, I'm thinking of a little thing called like a um, caller school survival kit that would be a little, uh, a little packet that you could give somebody before they go there, but that would also be uh, simple enough that they could have it there with them. And so you wouldn't have necessarily all the, uh, all, all the different things, but you'd have, you know, a box one, four and one P2P and, you know, uh, maybe one more things like that, um, things that they could look at, you know, while they're there, because they, maybe they reviewed it in the hotel room or something, but hmm. uh, yeah, it'd have to be laid out just right. So that, you know, for quick, uh, for quick glancing at while they're uh, doing it, there's probably a, a few other things besides just the terminology that would. Yeah. Well, well this all said that... several Go other ahead, things that I, several other things that I've done is because when you're talking, learning the timing of the calls, the way it's laid out is not conducive to a learning style. So I actually made myself a spreadsheet and it says two beat calls and it listed everything, three beat calls, it listed everything, four beat calls. And I've shared that with multiple people and they love it. And I did the same thing with starting formations. This can be called from this starting formation. I took uh, an ocean wave and I put everything that you could possibly call from an ocean wave because that was the way my mind learned. It wasn't, mm -hmm. here's the call, here's all the details to that call. It was, here's the starting formation, here's what you can do with it. And so those kinds of documents, I haven't seen anywhere else besides what I've created myself. I believe you had a different call analysis sheet as well that you uh, do. I think you made a presentation on that on Don's session once, did you not, Jenna? Yeah, and, and that's on the Caller Lab Knowledge Database. Yeah. And there, there are those types of things. One of the things that we, we definitely encourage here, uh, as you saw when we were talking about uh, dealing with cross the street box, I am an absolute believer in the absolute best calling, teaching and dancing method for learning is the one that works for you, that you give your dancers the most success. And how I do it may not be the way Jeff does it, may not be the way that Janet does it, but how you look at it is just as important how guido sets up 
uh, his, his teaching compared to how Jeff sets up his teaching are two complete, completely different styles, but both works. So if there are different styles and different ideas like Janet's call analysis sheet, which is very different uh, than the one that Caller Lab has, and Guido's is, is even different again, have a look at all of the material that is available. Have a look at some of these different sessions and these different ideas. Don't focus on them, but approach them with an open mind because as uh, Yolanda noted when Bob Elling gave the thing on working with cross the, uh, cross the street boxes, keeping them in sequence and working it made a big difference on, on that approach. That worked for her. And if you can see something that works for you that you can develop as your own and that works for you and gives your dancers success, that's the best method. Absolutely. The one that works for you that gives your dancers the joy on the floor. See, we have a you may or may not agree with another caller. That's not important. What's important is the dancers are having fun and you can work together and say, you know, my way is not the only way. Yeah, we have a different call analysis sheet as well from the Color Lab one, and it's on our website. And it was developed mm -hmm. by the students at our schools over, over a period of a couple of years. Um, and that one is also in the Color Lab knowledge database. Oh, is it there? Oh, cool. Yes, yep. it I is. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's interesting. Barry must have put that up. Well, actually, I think I gave it to him when I gave him mine. Oh, is that right? Okay. Barry and I worked on a couple of schools together, so. And I have like a question said, for Janet. They're... Sorry, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I got a question for Janet. Um, how strictly do you, um, with your list, like two beat calls and three beat, four beat calls or whatever, uh, do you go with? Because um, it's not so strict. It depends the timing on so many factors. Um, it's a rough guideline, as we say, the, the call of that timing list. Right. And it was just a list that I made so that I could memorize what quote is the standard that caller okay. lab had because their list the beat calls they were the calls were in alphabetical order and it didn't make any sense for me to learn it that way i i tried and it didn't work and so i i took okay two beats and these were all the calls and so that was just how i learned it, it you know it like you said it's it varies based on who you're teaching and stuff so that was yeah. just to learn there the basis is. of what the caller lab had there okay. is a there is a list out there, and if anybody has it, because I've been trying to find it again, it's very similar to what you're saying, Janet, and it's a list of um, call timing. It, it's called a call timing list complete, and it has not only the timing of the calls, but it has the delivery time of how long it takes to say the calls, and then it also has the lead time on the calls. And it was a complete list, and I've been trying to find it. If anybody has that, or has a copy of that and they could send send me the reference to it that would be great because that in itself is a whole surrounds people look at you know how long does it take to do swing through okay well you've got x number of beats to do swing through okay but it takes two beats to say swing through great so when do i have to have my lead time prep i have to take my breath to get that out two beats before so that I can say those two beats. So at three beats before I have to have my breath in to say swing through, you know, it's those kinds of lead time, command time, execution time. And then how far along this movement for the next movement do I need? Uh, it was a great list. I have no idea uh, where it is. I knew I was in Canada when I saw it, but I have no idea where, where that actual list is. If anybody has that or has a copy of it, uh, by all means, share that information because it's that kind of stuff that really shouldn't get lost. And that met with a silence. <laughs> I would love to see that list too, but I, I have not seen it anywhere. I've gone searching for things like that and didn't find it. Janet, you said you're a new caller. How long have you been calling? Um, well, I've five years. Okay. Do you site call or do you use modules or memory or what? I am a site caller, but at the national caller school, I mean, I knew the value of modules, mm -hmm. but now I know that there is a value to modules that different. And so actually what I'm doing is I am kind of taking your program and adding a little twist to it. Cause what I'm doing in the process now is I'm creating a little module or several for each particular call so that I've got 
you know, your singing call figures from your program, but then I've got all these little zero modules that I can use for a particular call to, to create pattern for that one particular call using that call and only the core 20. So that's kind of what I'm working on now. Perfect. That's good. That's good. What you've done with your list, creating your list, saying where calls start from, do you say where they end? I have another spreadsheet that does say like, um, and it lists, it, it starts in an ocean wave, it ends in an ocean wave. And then there's a list that says it starts in an ocean wave, it ends in a line. It starts in this formation, it ends in this formation. So there's lots of different things there. That yeah, one's that, a pretty complicated thing. That's an excellent way though, to be able to develop your site calling um, because you know where the call ends before they actually get there. So many callers at site call actually don't have logged in their memory where that call is going to end until the dancers stop. And you know, and, that's and, funny that you say that because, at, I mean, I was heavily involved in education, but what I did see at, at nationals this go round when they had some of the, the caller school people doing the calling was that was exactly what I saw is that they had no idea where the call ended or their timing was way off because they had no idea how long to wait before they said the next call. Right. And that's, that's very common of site callers. Very common, more common than anybody would ever believe, <laughs> but it, but it is it. And that's where the term stop and go dancing came from. When site calling became very prominent, stop and go dancing became very prominent. Yeah. Because <clears throat> callers, callers didn't know where those calls ended. So, yeah, oh, Janet, uh, I, ju I just put this, this, this is something I've been asked to share a lot of these, the format for, uh, I, what I call on these things are focus modules. So like, for instance, this is a focus module on cloverleaf. So if I'm preparing to do a dance, I've got two singing calls. One's a little easier. One's a little bit more complex. And then just simple corner box to corner box conversion modules partner line to partner line and a resolution module for each. And I prepare these things. We, we call them focus modules. Um, and the strength of strength of something like that is very much along the line of what you're saying is if you're going to call a dance and you have a specific movement. So this one was cloverleaf. You prepare a series of modules that short modules that will use that cloverleaf from the various formations that you can always set up a corner box or you can always set up a partner line. You can use that and you can just pick and choose or you can chop and change these modules, corner box to corner box, corner box to partner line, partner line to resolve. And you can just call a series of modules all night or use your isolated site, all those other kinds of things with the expansion kit. Um, I, Guido, also you, ha you have a similar type of system where you have a lot of modules with with different focus a lot of people have the, the same kind of thing i like to do this when i prepare to call a, a dance or if I'm, I'm getting ready for a festival or something like that this is up at 22 point font on my screen uh, and it's over there off to the side i may or may not look at it but i keep the modules fairly short practiced so that if i do need to to refer to it or if i'm having trouble on the floor or if i'm having an issue with site calling I can just quickly glance over and refresh at a glance a module rather than read the modules, however you develop it. Different people will have different styles and, and different things to do, but there's nothing wrong. And I think it's an absolutely fantastic idea that you're doing is once you have a singing call or a something that you want to present for a tip to develop short sequence modules that highlight and focus on what is the focus movement or the focus theme of that tip or something so that everything will tie together and tie your patter into your singing call for the maximum success for the dancers. Right. And the one, one thing that if you look at Mel's figures here, the one thing that you want to concentrate on when you're building these modules to highlight a specific call, if you look at his sequences, almost all of them, the cloverleaf is near the very end. You want a quick get out because if they fail on it, because that's his highlighted call, if they fail on it, they don't have to stand around and wait for very long. This way, he's got it so it's close to the end, so it's an easy out. And when you're working on calls that you want to highlight like that, you can take as long as you like to get into it. But once you get 
the call done, you want to get out as quickly as possible so that you can resolve and get them back home feeling comfortable and happy. Yeah. And you, you can build a bunch of these, like I said, if I wanted Dixie style, I've got, I've got a few of these that are built that, you know, if you want to focus on a specific movement that you can just chop and change, you can put them in and those can be applied to pretty much anything. All you have to do is look at your singing call, create, you know, create a singing call that goes into whatever. So that when you're actually doing something up there, you can play with your material. You've got some stuff prepared in the background that you've already practiced that you're familiar with, and you can constantly develop and develop and develop and redevelop. And you basically build yourself a kit of focus modules so that over time, um, like Jeff's core 20, you've got your core 20 they're doing, ah, you can build yourself here's a bunch of, of singing call figures with a core 20, but tonight I want to look at Cloverleaf or tonight I want to look at Swing Through or tonight I want to look at this. You can build an entire evening around that idea, two movements for the idea and use everything you know and build and build and build. And what you'll find is your own repertoire is going to increase exponentially as you do this because you become practiced in using a limited amount of material, getting innovative, using a focus and seeing exactly what that does. So, you know, it's just, a, it's a, it's a methodology, but it's a combination methodology. And yep. uh, having sat in a few of your sequences, Janet, your, like your session on your, your um, call analysis sheet and a few others, I know you're very innovative. <laughs> you come up with a way of looking at things that is very refreshing. Well, thank you. I, the one thing when I'm doing my teaching, I, uh, usually have to dance. So I wear my headset. So if there's something that we're working on, I, I love index cards. I have like, it's like a half an index card and I have this big, huge ring so that I can dance with this ring of cards. If I need to, it, to work through specific things that I'm working through. The other thing I do with the teaching that really, really, really is very extremely helpful that I wish other people would learn to utilize is that I videotape everything. And yes, I go back and I watch the lessons that I just taught because that helps me write my choreography for the next mm -hmm. week review of mm -hmm. what they need to work on or it tells me what I need to reteach because I didn't teach it well the first time or they didn't get it. So I need to reword it so that they can understand it. And so that's a learning tool I found invaluable. I believe there's something similar in your presentation on teaching and your teaching methodology as you write your notes what good each session you just make your quick notes and you review them at the end uh, for later use what needs to be reviewed what not on your teaching program jeff yeah uh, is that yeah 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 it's all it's all there and you know it's, it's wording is very critical for a lot of people and you know just saying the same thing over and over and over again if they didn't get it the first time guess what they're not going to get it the second third fourth fifth sixth time you have to find a different way to say it and, uh, and, and I'm assuming, Janet, that's what you get out of your, your video, your teaching videos, when you go back and look at it, and they didn't get it, then you, you figure out a different way to try and get it across to them. And that's what people fail at when they're teaching. And they say, oh, my dancers don't get it. Well, they don't get it because you're not giving it to them properly. Right. Um, I mean, let's face it. There are some people that will never get this activity. They're there because they got dragged out for one reason or another, and they will never be a square dancer, but they're going to show up every night and it's just the way it is. And you have to accept that and that's okay. But the majority of people are there to learn something and have some fun at it. And so the more that the more ways that you can teach the same thing to get everybody to understand it is, is great. And if you're doing a video and you can go back and look at that video and say, oh, well, they didn't get it or they didn't get it. Oh, my. This is a different way I can say it. So I will change it around. And, you know, that's with, with the books. We try and make sure that there's a lot of repetitiveness in there for the teaching. Um, and yes, it only has singing call figures for the choreography. And I say right in the book, you are encouraged to write your own choreography. This is a starting point. And I'm really glad to hear that you are actually writing sequences because I know there are a lot of people that don't. They just use those books and that's it. They don't give their dancers anything extra. So eventually the dancers memorize those routines because that's all they hear. 
Um, and, and it's great that you're writing your own stuff and presenting it with, uh, with theme tips. That's really good. That's well, actually I, one of the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Janet. I, I have loved your books. They have been extremely helpful. And I, I have many different programs and have done analysis of many different programs. And I've taken bits and pieces of everything and kind of put them together. And like you said, Mel, it, I found that that works for me. And the gal that I'm starting to mentor, I says, get a hold of all the information you can, listen to everybody you can, and you're going to get some good advice. You're going to have to get get some bad advice. You're going to have to sit there and sort through, you know, what's going to end up working for you. So, mm -hmm. and you usually what you'll find is something will trigger a response, and it'll be that favorable response. And when you watch, is it's something to really watch for if you are mentoring a new dancer, a new caller, I should say. Watch that light in their eyes that comes on because every now and then something will come across and it'll just light up in their eyes ah when that first thing gels that's a focus you don't want to belabor that point but you want to encourage that point because that's the seed that's germinated right and that's the seed you want to encourage to grow because everything else will tie into that eventually and sometimes that doesn't happen until you're three or four sessions into it sometimes it doesn't happen for a month and sometimes it happens on the first first session but you really got to watch for that light to come on one of the, um, you're talking about that thing. I uh, lost a train of thought here. I'll come back to it later. Oh, <laughs> languages. You were saying <laughs> languages, Look, looking, to, yeah. <laughs> looking <laughs> to say things. It's a good idea to be able to try and explain something uh, at least three different ways. Okay. And if you can search to do that and explain and teach something in three different methodologies, three different ways, three, three different mechanisms, that's your baseline. Get as many as you can, like Jeff was saying. But it always reminded me of explaining things differently. There's a running gag in Canada about going to explain things in Quebec. And you get English speakers going to Quebec, where a lot of them speak English, but a lot of them don't. They speak French there. And the standard way of explaining things different is you say it louder and you put on a French accent, but you say it exactly <laughs> the same way. Yeah. That does not work in square dancing. <laughs> No. <laughs> saying it louder and putting on an accent does not work <laughs> not at all no so so talking about new things remember how before i all i wanted to do was singing calls and patter was something mm -hmm. i was so guess what i did terrified last... is the word you're looking yes, for yes yes <laughs> and, and so guess what i actually did uh, last week on the floor um we ended up with uh we didn't have enough enough people for a full square so i did two couple a full five minutes of on the fly calling with and, and i actually had some modules memorized and i threw them in and stuff like that and the change on the look of the dancers towards me when i did that was just <laughs> Cool. It was like, oh, that's yes, <laughs> that's excellent Good for you. As, as Daryl Clendenin put, put out earlier, almost all of the calling you do is across the grid. And essentially what you're working with, the exception of few movements, is three two couple boxes, one on each end and one in the center. And when you can move those three two couple boxes around, you're working with them independently. Most most of your square dance choreography up to plus, what is it, 87.3% or something like that, is two couple choreography. Hmm. And this is why one of the baseline skills for new callers to, to practice is the basic principle of isolated sight, two couple choreographic calling, working in something like a Sicilian circle to encourage fun and moving them around, just moving the dancers and getting them back to that footprint. You'd be surprised how much of a world that opens up to you. And I know, Yolanda, you found that uh, during the COVID, working with two couples and then working with two couples as a square for your singing calls, but still calling two couple choreography, taking that back into a full square is a skill that is going to serve you fantastic. And it's going to serve you great when you start really developing those sight skills, such as the rubber banding, moving your two couples around the squares, changing, chopping and change, interacting, and the you know, what I, what I call an interactive Ferris wheel and centers pass through. That's an interactive. Couples circulate twice. That's an interactive because you, you're seeing 
that movement and flow, and yet you can start playing. Then you add your chicken plucker routine or cross the street, and then you do more two couple. It makes the big differences, the invert and rotate, and then still doing the two couple choreography. That is skills in development that once you get that down, that's not so much pure sight calling, it's the use of the modules and techniques. When you do start getting into that sight calling, wow, you're gonna be surprised at just how easy it is. For too long, and I think you alluded to this in your presentation, our focus was get them sight calling, get them moving. You don't have to know what, what all this does. You just have to know what they can do from there and you can call anything. And then you gotta know how to resolve a square. And there was no foundation of what flow was. There was no foundation of what the mechanics were. There was no foundation of all of this. We are slowly going back to that. And we've got a potential, and I'm so glad you're doing this, Janet. We've got a potential of building new callers for the future and new dancers for the future that have a foundation of skills that can be developed from instead of having to go back and relearn, you know, put out the great site caller, and then he's got to go back and learn what these movements actually do. We, we've done that for too long. So I love both of you. Congratulations to both yeah. of you. That is yeah, fantastic. And, that and, you're and doing that. One of the other things I'm working on is formation development. So where for, go from how to get from one formation to the other formation and then, good, you know, and then having more than one way to get there. Yeah. Daryl's really um, helping us with that. I was just going to say Daryl Clendenin is posting some um, sessions or, or manuals, books, exercises like that on Facebook. He also has a small group of, of callers that he's working newer callers that deal with this kind of thing is actually understanding what does what on the floor, those basic foundation principles. So I encourage every, every caller to, to get a hold of those and try them out. Yeah, that's good. Pat Patter's good. actually becoming fun. <laughs> when you it were talking about the two, the two couple thing, the big thing that hit me when, when, we went to Zoom calling during COVID is that so many callers said, oh, I'm not gonna do that. I can't do just two couple stuff. And I was like, mm, you do it all the time. And so it told me they had really no idea what they were doing because they couldn't call with just four people. I was like, how can you not call with four people? And then another thing Yolanda just said was um, going from formation to formation, my creative mind decided well, if I can go from formation to formation, certainly I should be able to start at a starting point and hit every single formation and that get back to that original starting point. So I actually wrote choreography that I used each formation once and I went through all the different formations and got everybody home, but it's somewhere in my big, huge stack of, uh, you know, paperwork so well, I'm, I'm going to use an example and this is when i was talking with yolanda when we were talking the difference between two couple and four couple formation management and when you i don't know if you remember this uh, yolanda but working with two couples is so much easier than working with four couples because you can manage the formation because it's always a box i mean it's not always but just generally i said okay well if you've got two couples and you call star through you've, you've still got a box but anything that has that kind of a change aspect is a four couple formation change. So star through from facing lines is a box. Star through from a box takes us to lines. Thanks. And it, it's, it's when, when those light, when you see that light come on, it's, oh yeah, that, that, is, that is right. <laughs> Once, if I change a formation aspect in two couples, I've created a new formation in an entire square and becoming aware of that. And what you just said, Janet, is a principle that has been one of the guiding principles in this, getting those foundations down. It came to me in one of the first college schools that I went to, where I'd only been calling for 10 years at this point. I went to a caller school and the callers got up because there's a mix and match of skills. They all got to present themselves first. This was before any evaluation and all but four of us, um, called plus. I, I, I called mainstream because I was told it was going to be a mainstream, you know, newer callers. And they were calling plus one called an advanced tip. And I'm going, I'm way out of my league with these people. And it was Ken Rattusi, Bill Harrison, Tony Oxendine, and Randy Page were running this school. And then they set the parameters right now from here on in, nobody's allowed to call anything above mainstream. And they all did another tip. 
And it was amazing. All these fantastic presentation callers could not call a standard mainstream dance. And then when we took it back to basic, they were really, really, really struggling because they'd taken away all that stuff that was their crutch. And you're saying the same thing, Janet when you have to go back and actually do all these little bits and pieces of two couple, they're so used to that. You took away that comfort zone. The fact is they were already doing it. They just weren't aware they were doing it because they didn't understand the foundation. That's the same with calling. That's the same with mentoring. Get that foundation and get them to understand and enjoy that. And it will build so much easier. It may take a little longer at the start, but it's a lot better for them in the long run. And they'll stick with the activity a lot longer and chances are their dancers will too. We did, I did a lot of calling through COVID. We did, uh, we had four different Zoom groups every week. Um, the one thing I found though, was that when I, when I first started with them, um, the site calling was, was not working because when you've got people on Wi-Fi and you've got people on connected cable and you've got people using a phone, all the screens are moving at different times. Mm -hmm. Everything's yes. moving at different <laughs> times, right? Yes. So if you want to keep your dancing smooth, I discovered that I had to write all my, I've written hundreds and hundreds of two couple choreography. But what I did first was I created a page of all the two couple calls for basic mainstream and plus. I also have advanced as well, but on these fronts, I also put the timing beside each and every call so that I know what they are when I'm writing my choreography. And I mean, I would sit for hours and hours and write choreography and I would call like I would be calling a normal dance. And what I discovered was, is that even though the screens were all moving at different times, all the people were dancing on the beat because they were dancing when they heard it. Yep. And I saw several instances where callers were sight calling on Zoom and they were sight calling on a screen and the rest of the screens were out to lunch because they just, it didn't work timing wise. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the two couple thing, and by the way, most of my screens were only one couple, they were dancing with phantoms. Mm -hmm. So in my notes, when I did my calling, I would tell them when they were back with their original, I would always say, you know, pass the ocean original by the right hand. So if they weren't, they could adjust quickly. Um, and I found that that kept everybody moving along a little bit better and made them feel a lot more comfortable with the two couple concept when there's only one couple. So yeah, the zoom dancing is, was, was really interesting. Um, if you really want to understand the timing differentiation on zoom, yeah. get two or three callers together, have yeah. one of them put on the music yeah. and try and do <laughs> harmony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we, we tried that in one of our sessions and it did not work. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's different, but yeah, I mean, I, I think Zooming was great. I mean, I, I, we actually, our round dance club, we're not going to stop it. We're, gonna, we're not going back to brick and mortar in our round dance club. We're going to do a once a month gathering so that people can have the social aspect of it, but they can round dance in their own property, in their own home. And most people have no issues with doing it. And mm -hmm. uh, our round dance club was an hour and a quarter away from us. The hall prices have gone up dramatically because of COVID. Um, so we've just decided we're, we're just going to keep zooming with it. And it's, uh, it's a great, great process. It really is. Hmm. Well, yeah, we found a lot of benefits, didn't we, Yolanda? There were people, yeah. there's someone that had arthritis and she wouldn't dance because it hurt her hand, but her husband knew how to look after that. So she da dances on Zoom. And yeah. if you get snowed in, you could still dance. You could get yep. to the dance. And people yeah. that had to travel three hours to get to seas or whatever, they could dance in their own home. Yeah, yeah they missed the, miss the social. But if you have times like this afterwards where people can sit and mm -hmm. chat, and, you know, yeah. yeah, back and forth, you know, that helps. It's not certainly not face to face stuff, but it does keep them in touch. Yeah. And, and I, uh, I know I know of several groups that will start half an hour early so that yeah. people can socialize before. And in between brackets, we always have a chat and a laugh, don't we, Yolanda? So, oh, yes. Yes. And we've, <laughs> we've met so many, I know so many people now that when I go yeah. to America, yeah. I actually yeah. know people. Oh, I, I actually, I've had, I've had um, people that I never met before um, that were lived in BC that, but didn't 
you know, because we're on different levels and stuff. And I went higher when I was on Zoom. And they actually came and visited me wow. here at my, cool. at my home. And actually, I so that was like over a month ago or so. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a caller. And I and I come over to my house. And so we did harmony and stuff cool. in my house, right? So that's good. No, it, it it is it is great for that social relationship. It is great for keeping in contact. It's the same with these sessions. We found sometimes the most popular aspects of these classes is not the class. They're always valuable. But you know, I open this up about seven seven thirty every time, and we may get two anywhere from two to ten people. And then like here, we've got you know myself and ten others talking talking square dance or just socializing and enjoying yeah. that aspect of it, which is something that is sorely missing. Uh, it will get less and less as we go on and get back into the grand scheme of things, but I hope we don't lose that contact and that touch. Well, you know, square dancing is still got issues. We have, I have a, I have a in-person club. It's my plus DBD summer, summertime group. And one of our dancers came out two weeks ago with COVID and within five days, 14 others had it. So, so we had to cancel last week because it was more than half the club was down with COVID. Yes. And so yeah. Zoom dancing Zoom is dancing, so yes. much <laughs> healthier. Yeah, right. it's healthier, absolutely. <laughs> Way healthier. Well, but it's, it's a, uh, having us adapt to, because in my area, it's just lack of people. Okay. So there were, I'm in Southern Indiana and between Indiana, I mean, between Ohio and Illinois, and Louisville and Indianapolis, there are two clubs, the one I created and another club. And so the, the club that I created is, is, we're not really dancing, it's more of a philosophy, but we've connected up with uh, the parks department and we are uh, dancing at the parks department. So Jeff, what I'm doing in this next go around, we just finished our, our 12 weeks of SSD, but what we're doing for our next set that we're going to pick up in July, we're literally doing a six week core 20 class. Okay. And then from there, what I'm hoping will happen is that we can have dances, but that wasn't where I was headed. What I, what I was headed with this is sometimes we only have three couples. Yeah. So what do you do when three couples show up? You dance a triangle. Yeah. And so they've been learning, you know, Instead of somebody being across from me to do that right and left through, I'm going to turn to my corner for that right pull by, and there's automatically going to be somebody there to do that courtesy turn with. So we're adapting with what we yeah. have just because we don't have people. We're hoping to gain more people, you know, through the parks department, but there's just not many of us here. Sort of the I, smallest Sicilian circle that you can do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty small, but you could do it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, the Sicilian circles that they did at nationals went phenomenal. We had 128 on the floor dancing, 86 had never tried that before. I'll tell you a story. I was, I did a, I was hired to do a Christmas party, a corporate Christmas party for a company that had their stores right across Canada. And they had bust in employees from every single store. And there were 400 people in this room. They, they rented uh, one of the local, um, what do you call them? It was a, <laughs> they had a huge auditorium. It was a it convention was a center. Well, it wasn't a convention center. It was where they usually have the, the um, like the plowing matches and things like that. Oh, okay. Right. And they had this huge auditorium that we were in. It was all concrete floor. And so we had 400 people there. And when I started, I started a Sicilian circle. Well, I started with a circle. And I ended up with Sicilian circles. And 25 minutes later, I'm still going. And we never did break them into squares at that point, because at that point, I had to stop because apparently dinner was ready. The food was ready. So we stopped, but I had people coming up to me for the next hour, thanking me for that session because they said they got to meet face-to-face -face people that they've talked to on the phone for years that they've never, ever seen because they're in a different province. Mm -hmm. And like, I just moved them around the circle. And I mean, it was great because they just passed you and on to the next. And they had a ball with that thing, but we had almost all 400 people in that circle. <laughs> 
that was really pretty cool. <laughs> I liked with my class and club sessions when I was running them in Canada with Mississippi Squares and all the other clubs, we always had enough dancers to do a Sicilian circle. And we started every night like that yeah. because it was a good way to refresh, to review. But also once you had them going, if somebody came in five minutes later, they could just join if there was a couple standing free, stand in front of them. If not, if everybody was even couples, just get in and pick a direction and somebody would come to you very shortly and you got to dance and interact with everybody. And I always ended it back out in a big circle of right and left grand, say hi to everybody. No singing call, but just away we go. And it is such a great venue for not only the dancers, but for, for the caller, because there's no pressure on anybody. No. You, you, you can't help but succeed. You call pass through, move to the next, give a two second pause or a forward and back after a star through and everybody is danced and fixed. There's no pressure. Uh, I do apologize for leaving very shortly. We just had a big power outage here. So <laughs> I'm going to have to. You're still on. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to move. It, I just got back in, actually. I lost the mm -hmm. internet and everything. So, yeah. Um, uh, Jeff, I, I I'm going over. to get going. I'm going to leave the, the, the session running uh, if you want to stay. But I don't know if, if I do end up getting knocked out, if it's going to chop off. But no, thank you, everybody, it. for coming in. And thanks, Jeff, yep. again. And we're definitely going to have you My back. Pleasure. OK. And thank thanks, you, everybody. Jeff. Thank you, Appreciate it. And thank Janet, you. we're going to look at thank seeing you, if we can do thank something you. on mentoring. Thank you. OK. Take, Take care, care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys. Take it easy. And Mark, I already did say thank you to you a number of times, but you weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you're still muted. I heard somebody talking about me. <laughs> Your ears were burning, weren't they? All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye, yeah. guys. Take care of yourselves. Nice finish.